Okay, we're going to go ahead and call this meeting to order. So please, let's do the roll call. Councilwoman Zendejas? Present. Councilwoman Allen? Present. Councilwoman Price? Present. Councilman Supernaw? Here. Councilwoman Mungo? Councilwoman Saro? Present. Councilmember Yuranga? Present. Councilman Austin? Here. Vice Mayor Richardson? Present. Mayor Garcia? Thank you very much, and I'm here also. We are going to begin today with a moment of silence and the pledge, and that'll be led by Councilman Saro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like us to take a moment of silence uh, and to keep all those who are um, impacted by the rise, the, the variant, uh, COVID variant at the moment. Thank you. Please rise if you're able to and to. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. We have a uh, consent calendar in front of us. If I can get a motion in a second. Okay, there's no public comment for consent calendar. I have Councilwoman Allen, I think they wanted to make a, had a remark or a question. Yes, I just have a couple questions uh, for uh, staff. Um, you hear me say this a lot, but I think it's important that we support our local businesses with our city expenditures. Um, with regards to item uh, 10, the landscape contract, um, I see I, or I'm happy to see that there are uh, 44 local jobs um, that will be created by that. I'm not sure how we measure that or verify that. But my question is, um, when these uh, contracts, when that contract was awarded in 2008, were there any local applicants? Uh, if um, Brent Dennis or um, uh, Eric Lopez can come up and talk a little bit about that, please. Or Sandy, is that you? Council member, um, our, show, our system shows that we notified 100 local businesses that indicated in their registration in our potential vendor database that they would be interested in this type of opportunity, but no local business indicated interest in the opportunity for responding. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, I have one more uh, question on item 14, the engineering contract. Um, I see that the consultants have committed to using um, small and local or disadvantaged firms as sub consultants based on the work that's going to be assigned to them by the city. Uh, again, I'm not sure how we uh, contract, I mean, how we uh, verify that. Um, so I definitely would uh, down the road like to understand more about how we do that. And, um, and just make sure that they are indeed uh, using um, our small businesses and that that does funnel down. Um, and then I have one more comment or question on item 15, the storm drain maintenance contract. Um, it says that it would preserve six Long Beach residents' jobs. Um, when that contract was awarded in 2016, were there any uh, local applicants that apply for that? Council member on item 15, our system shows that we notified 354 local businesses that indicated that they would be interested in this type of opportunity. And there were three responses to the RFP and one was a local Long Beach business. Okay, and were they like SBE, WBE? Uh, the uh, United Stormwater Inc. is a Long Beach small business enterprise, which means that the city certified them as a small business through our local SBE program. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all my questions. Thank you. Councilman Zendejas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to really take a quick moment to highlight and um, acknowledge the significance of this item. One's ability to live, work, study, and play in its own city um, should not be dependent on whether you live with or without a disability. That is what this item is about, declaring to the world that here in Long Beach, we are a city committed to breaking 
and uh, any and all barriers to accessibility and true equity for all. So that's on item number one. And on item number nine, I just wanted to say homelessness is a multifaceted issue and one of my great concerns, uh, you know, and a concern nationwide as well. Um, and our city is putting forth a lot of different projects and programs, resources um, to address these issues. Therefore, I think it is important that we highlight all the work that is being done to help our houseless neighbors and to inform the residents about the, these resources. So I was wondering if staff may be able to just highlight um, a couple of the things that we're being, that are being done um, here in the city and maybe cover a little bit of the HHAP block grant that is um, what the project that this fund would be helping. Yes, if we can have our Health and Human Services representative talk about item nine on the consent calendar, please. Thank you, I'd appreciate it. They may be in the back. Let me see if we can bring them out here. Do you, if, they're, if they're not there, Mr. Modica, do you want to make some remarks or I can uh, bring this item back? Uh, yeah, if we can uh, just pull this item then and we can get to it at the end of the meeting. Okay, we'll get to this item at the end of the meeting. Is that okay, Councilwoman? Yes, thank okay. you. So there's a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. Please cast your votes. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Um, I just have one announcement, and that is today, tonight is National Night Out. Uh, National Night Out is a, uh, an event that happens uh, annually within the community. Uh, it's an opportunity for uh, neighborhoods and uh, community organizations and um, small businesses uh, to plan community awareness nights, uh, along with uh, 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 members of the police department within our city. There are police partnerships that are highlighted today across the community uh, with neighborhood associations. Um, and I know that we have uh, members of our police department out across the community tonight um, at a variety of events. I also know that there are many events within all of our communities. Uh, some of the council members here are also um, will be attending some of those after the council meeting. So I will do my best to uh, try to move the, the agenda along as best possible. Um, also recognizing that there are some key issues on here as well. And so I will do my best. Uh, we were, I'm gonna come back to the budget. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and uh, do items 21, 22, 27 and 29, all the funds transfers as one item, Madam Clerk. Communication from Councilwoman Zendejas, recommendation to increase appropriations in the city manager department by 500 to support the Long Beach Blues Society Blues for All event. Item 22, communication from Councilwoman Zendejas, recommendation to increase appropriations in the city manager department by 10,000 to provide a contribution to social and environmental entrepreneurs to support their youth sports and mentoring program, Books and Buckets. Councilman Zendejas. Mayor, would you like me to read the other two items? Uh, I thought you had read all of them. Just please, no. Read, read so all of them, please. The other two items are item 29 and is it 27? Yes. Item 27, communication from Councilwoman Price, recommendation to authorize city manager to execute all documents necessary to accept and expend grant funding from the Port of Long Beach. And item 29, communication from Councilwoman Saro, Councilwoman Zendejas, Councilmember Uranga, Recommendation to increase appropriations in the city manager department by 3,586 to support the Wrigley Village Block Party. Councilman Zendejas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it takes a strong community to build a strong community. Individuals stepping up, willing to uh, put in the work and willing to work together to create solutions and address the issues they may, they may 
see in their community as they live in this community. That is why I am proud and a strong supporter of our new Books and Buckets program, a youth program that is very much needed in our Washington neighborhood. And I am excited to continue supporting this program. I would li now like to um, give my remaining time to David so he can speak a little bit more about the program if David is here. I don't see David. Yeah, thank you. Councilman Price? I support this item. Councilman Saro? I just wanted to speak to item 29 around um, the village block party that you know that's the first in-person event i was able to host since i've been in office and i thought that it was a great kickoff to doing um more in-person event particularly bringing resources to community and bringing residents together to to connect but also to activate the small businesses in the wrigley village area and um, looking forward to continuing the work and the celebration in our wrigley village area and throughout the other parts of the districts thank you Thank you. There's a motion and a second by Councilman Zendejas and Price. Members, please cast your votes. There is public comment on item 22. I'm sorry about that. Please, uh, let's Tanai call Kenfei. public comment. Is your public comment? Tanai Kenfei, please come to the podium. And then can, can someone from the clerk's office hand me the public comment because I don't have any up here. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sanai Kenfei, uh, District 6 resident. I'm just coming today in support of Books and Buckets. Uh, I think it's an amazing opportunity, a youth-led organization in the Washington District that's really speaking to the needs of um, the community. And I, I want to say uh, much respect to Councilwoman Zendeja for ushering uh, locals in her neighborhood in her district an opportunity to lead the youth towards positivity. I, as a person that runs a bookstore, um, would love to support by donating books. I'm a big fan of David uh, and everything that him, him and his associates are doing. And, uh, you know, feeling very generous, Miss Indeha. So, you know, I don't know if there's anybody here from the organization, but would love to give some money as well. Because uh, it's important that private individuals also step up to support the youth, not just the city. So thank you. Also wanted to say thank you to Councilwoman uh, uh, Sorrow's uh, amazing block party. I didn't know if it was, you know, <laughs> li liability issue. That's why I don't want to say anything. But it was a great um, block party. Uh, I grew up in Wrigley Village, was born in Pacific Hospital. So it's great to see so many people on Pacific Avenue and uh, lots of children and pinatas. And uh, it was a great opportunity to see everyone out. And thank you again, Councilwoman. Mayor, I think we might have a, a video. Does that, do you guys have the Books and Buckets video? We'll cue that up right now. Thank you. It isn't your typical youth sports program. I'm Kristen Lago in Long Beach, where I'll introduce you to the founder, who is from this neighborhood and is now back on the courts he grew up in, hoping to bring others up with him along the way. Ever heard the saying, ball is life? It's definitely a way of life for 12-year-old Stephen Shepard. I, I was playing since I was like three with my grandpa. We were playing in this court right here. Since then, he spent almost every day here dribbling, passing, and shooting with his neighborhood friends or as part of a summer program called Books and Buckets. I would tell them that's a great program with lots of responsibilities because you also have to practice but also keep your book and read about it so then you can educate your mind about what's happening and motivate yourself in life. The program was started by another kid from the neighborhood, David McGill Soriano, who used to spend all his free time with friends on this very court. You know, it came when I was growing up right here in the Washington neighborhood. There was no youth program. There was no youth center. 
and I wanted to be a part of something. David would take an hour-long bus ride out of the Washington neighborhood every week. All to join a youth program he says helped his physical and mental development. When I got older, I was thinking like, man, what if what if our neighborhood had that? You know, what if I didn't have to take that bus ride? What if I had to do all that? And so when he got older, he did just that, bringing others who grew up in the area back with him. The camp brings an academic side with group discussions, readings, and guest speakers, and mixes it all together with, well, I think you can guess what. The, the part that really reels them in is the basketball part, the basketball academy. But more so than just developing for their future, it's a means to keep them safe in the present. This neighborhood wrapped with its share of gang violence. Kids as young as Steven have already experienced it. So basically there's there's a lot of gang violence and they want to influence you to do bad things. And it's things like this that motivated David to keep his camp going. And our youth know them as well and know them and they go to school with them. Um, so if this program wasn't here, uh, you know, they might be a part of that. By being here, they gain more than just basketball knowledge. They gain community. You know, we'll pass them the ball and they take the shot. At the end of the day, we give them the tools and they can help solve the problems in the neighborhood. Locals coming back to their hometown and putting the ball back in kids like Stevens court. There you go. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, with a motion and a second, please cast your votes. Motion carries. Thank you. And just a note for the clerk, I, I don't have any um, public comments up here, so I just want to make sure that. Currently there is. The, okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, next up is we're going to do uh, item 19. Actually, I'm sorry. Let's, let's do the, the, the four open public comment speakers. If you want to call those four to the podium. Our first speaker is Rich Charlie. After that is Renetta or Renetti Maza, Mike Donnellan, and Mark Nematu. Can we speak with this thing on? No. As a reminder, please uh, make sure to keep your mask on when you're speaking at the podium, and for the public as well, please keep your mask on while you're indoors. Thank you. I want to say thank you, Councilman uh, Mary Zendejas and Cindy Allen, for hosting and having a community meeting on homelessness last night. And it was a wonderful panel with Doug Halbert, Helen DeChico, Paul Duncan, Taylor Anderson, and Steve Bicot. It was quite informative and education. I want to say thank you. But I want to feed off that because I heard some things and I um, want to speak. And I gave each one of you a packet. Um, Hopefully I did it okay. I made a little error with Long Beach. Um, there are many organizations and wonderful people in our city that deal with unhoused population 24-7. Duke Givens, Ashley's Homeless Fund, Long Beach Rescue Mission, Villages of Cabrillo, Downtown Long Beach Alliance are just to name a few. Listening and seeing what all these organizations are doing, providing some kind of help, relief for our um, homeless and health crisis is quite amazing and remarkable. There's one thing that they're missing, and I think that um, this should be looked at, and I've been spending the whole COVID for 19 months researching, and I've got a binder of data, and I've actually been communicating um, with the WhatsApp with Amsterdam, Germany, and London on their programs. My sister lives in DC and volunteers for this uh, paper in DC for the unhoused. I was a homeless veteran sleeping on a public golf course and went through this system. And I'm telling you that it is almost impossible to obtain employment. Permanent housing is vital, as is mental and drug abuse. But the big problem is the gap of employment. And when I applied for 235 jobs in Long Beach when I was homeless at Cabrillo, zero hired me. I got passed over because they were like, ooh, we're not going to take that risk on a homeless person that might be mentally unstable. So please understand that there's a vital component that every one of these organizations I mentioned above is a need for the unhoused to get employment. So the city of Long Beach has received millions of dollars for the homeless health crisis, and this street paper would be written for the homeless, by the homeless, produced by the homeless, allowing um, a new job employment. This million dollars of grants could be used, I think, for this program that will be self-sufficient in three years and make money for the homeless population in the future and also providing wonderful references and fortunately in this city we have anti-city papers and pro-city papers and i think we need a third voice and it's the city of the un the population and view of the unhoused what do they see what do they need how can we 
we only see uh, the chronic homeless out in the streets, but what are the homeless people seeing? And it would be wonderful to educate our public. There's an interactive map of anyone in our city that would buy this paper, would have equity of like coupons and businesses. For example, if I buy a paper, I get a $5 off coupon. It would be uh, very, um, very, very well. And also it, an interactive map for the homeless people to say, oh, this, this is open between this time and I can get services from Bixby Park. This is how I go. Because unfortunately, a lot of the unhoused do not have the internet and the phone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. I think it's Renette Mazza. Good afternoon. I wanted to ask a couple questions about the policies between Caltrans and the city. I know a number of us have Caltrans running right through our neighborhoods. I live in the Hamilton neighborhood and I run the Hamilton Neighborhood Association. The 91 runs directly in the middle of our neighborhood. And it seems like the blight and neglect that Caltrans uh, leaves in our neighborhoods is just unbelievable. And as a resident, if I was to treat my property that way, I would get administrative citations, um, you know, notices. I would have to upgrade my premises. I would have to weed eat. I would have to, you know, make sure that my property looks nice and is a benefit to the community. I think that the Caltrans policies between the city and Caltrans are somewhat um, old and maybe need updated and maybe need reviewed and looked at the way they treat the community members and our city is embarrassing thank you for listening thank you and, and I just want to note that we are uh, we agree and I agree completely with you and I know that we're working right now on a uh, MOU with Caltrans and some other actions because um, it is very frustrating for, for you and for people across the city Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging. Thank you. Um, and next up, I think we have Mr. Donilon. Come on in. Yep. My support group. Um, Mayor Garcia, on behalf of our team and uh, kids that follow us all over the globe, we want to express our deepest sympathy for your loss last year. Uh, just want you to know that we care about that. 25 years ago, uh, I. I was on the city council running around Long Beach at community meetings and council meetings and commission meetings with a group of musty skateboarders promoting skate park development. I heard uh, it's not a sport. Uh, these kids aren't athletes. It's a waste of money. They're bad kids. It went on and on and on. And I just want to say welcome to skateboarding to the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Here's my future Olympians right here. <laughs> they are also ambassadors. We have an ambassador program. Uh, this one is Jer. I'm going to give you their first name. Uh, this is Jeremiah, proud resident of District 4. Uh, Dimitri, a lifetime resident of District 6. And one of our youngest, Girl Skate 2. Uh, Ray, she's a proud resident of District 6 also. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, they're, they're fixing whatever. It's been fixed. Okay, go ahead. Did I do something wrong? No, you're good, Mr. Donald. I want to keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, what I'm here to talk about are two things, specifically um, the Jeffrey Dempsey Memorial uh, competition that we do. It's our 10th year. Uh, Anitra Dempsey, who all of you know, uh, her son Jeffrey was killed in a skateboarding accident um, 10 years ago. Uh, Anitra reached out to me and wanted to do something to promote safety in skateboarding. And given the fact that 90% of the kids in skateboarding are killed on the streets and by automobiles, skate parks are the most, the safest and legal place for kids to enjoy their sports. So we built a, the um, uh, event around that. Uh, the Dempsey family comes out. We're going to recognize some more ambassadors. We'll be giving a scholarship to one of our kids. Uh, and it's, I'm glad Anitra's not here. She was going to go, and when her and I start talking about this, we both start crying. But uh, it, it's a huge honor for me to be able to do this to uh to rep you know for the dempsey family uh and it's a great event i think the vice mayor is going to be out there and chat with the guy we have a program at noon the skating starts right after the short program it goes until we're done uh you'll see some extremely talented young people um and so i hope some of you if, if you don't come just know that we're doing it and, it, and it's all good stuff uh also uh, since i only come down here every six or seven years 
Uh, I want to talk about the uh, uh, skate demo that we're going to do, requested by the Vice Mayor, Brother Richardson. We're going to activate the Houghton Skate Park during the uh, Jazz Festival, and we will do a demo from 12 to 4. And I wrote the people down because I always forget. We're going to have roller skating. Uh, we've done this before from the uh, Pigeon Roller Skate Shop on 4th Street Retro Row. Cindy, I met Council Member Allen knows them. Uh, and their, um, their skate team, the, their Huck skate team, will have BMX pros uh, from the X Games will be there. Uh, we will also have our really good friends from the Adaptive Sports League. Um, Mr. And of course, Donlin? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, your time is up. Is it? It Wait. is, but I'm going to let you just r r wrap up, Mr. Donlin, and then I can okay. go to the next meeting. Um, and, for all that we're doing, I want to thank our, our, our main sponsors, Boathouse on the Bay, the Big Bang, and the Peck family, uh, our family at Parks and Rec, Long Beach uh, uh, Police Department, Long Beach Unified School District, Doug Hobbard, um, and Long Beach CVB, the Port, of course, uh, Bob and Nancy Foster, and Barney Lowenthal, and all the people in Long Beach that have really gathered around to help me support these kids. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dolan. I'm going to feed these guys. We're going. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Books and Buckets, which we sponsor that, we co-sponsor that, they're here now. Amazing. Great work. Thank you. Love watching the kids over at the skate park. My new, my two-year-old just is in awe of all the kids and wants to take her scooter on the skate park so bad, and I'm just so afraid. She's just too little, but uh, we just love watching it. It's well, we, so we're, great. you know, give me a troubled kid, let me throw a skate park, skateboard under his feet, and we can make a difference in her life. Thank you. <laughs> and our next speaker, please. Mark. Nem two. Good evening. I am particularly concerned and confused by the city's direction and plan for downtown Long Beach. The previous representatives sought a goal of Pine Avenue being like Restaurant Row in La Cienega. However, it appears the street has become more like Fremont in Vegas or Bourbon Street in New Orleans. After 4 a.m., the smell of trash, vomit, and urine is quite present between the areas First and Broadway. Where I live in, on the promenade, we have made various upgrades in our building at great expense due to the, the effects of the clubs. We've had to replace alley doors with custom stainless steel doors to combat corrosion from urine. We've had to upgrade our home doors at great expense in order to reduce the impact of noise from the clubs. The noise from the clubs is a reason for my visit at City Hall today. I would like the city to begin to enforce the current laws and regulations relating to nightclubs in downtown Long Beach. The city's departments are not enforcing regulations on music volume, COVID rules, or even business licenses. Of the six bars and nightclubs in downtown, only one has an active entertainment license. The Harbor, Allegria, Shannon's, Shannon's on the top, and Agave all have expired entertainment licenses. Do these owners of these businesses have little respect for the city that they wouldn't pay the required city licenses? The police department is also not enforcing the laws of downtown. I don't see officers ticketing people for public drunkenness, open alcohol containers, or doing drugs in the neighborhood. I haven't seen a DUI sobriety checkpoint in years in downtown. Last weekend, we had a Jeep crash into a parked car in the alley of Altaway at two in the morning. I am willing to bet the driver was under the influence, given the speed of the vehicle and the fact that the police the vehicle fled the scene. I would also like the city to have a nightclub license, which would allow building code requirements, like building design material installation requirements, to ensure that businesses are productive cohabitations with local homeowners. I want. I don't want an adversarial relationship with these business owners. However, the lack of business nightclub licensing and building code requirements have led a low bar for business entry. Current clubs are poorly constructed for reducing noise and safety in the local environment. You have clubs that have glass railings on pine, which have potential risk for accidents and injuries. You've allowed nightclubs to build and construct roll-up doors in their upper level to project club music and DJ noise onto the street. Cities like Austin and New York City have aggressive processes for building codes and enforce laws to keep the businesses compliant. The lack of enforcement has created an anything goes perception in the neighborhood, which resulted in tragically in shootings, stabbings, and hit and runs now in a weekly occurrence. Please push the city departments to enforce the current laws of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Allen. Uh, yes, uh, uh, City Manager, can we um, 
Can I request that you look into this and see if those businesses that were listed, actually their um, entertainment uh, licenses are indeed expired, please? Yes, indeed. Uh, we also have that in writing from the gentleman. He sent that on to us, and we're um, uh, going to be looking into that. Thank you. Councilman Dejas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a question for the city clerk, I think. Um, I know David made it in, um, and I, he's here right now. Is it possible if he could speak during general public comment? This is the open public comment section. Um, normally we cut that off at 5 p.m., but he, oh. he has an opportunity to speak at second public comment at the end of the meeting if you'd like to speak then. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, um, okay, Councilwoman Allen, was that, was that everything? Yes, that was it. Okay, great, so then there's no more public comment, so members, please go ahead, we'll go to the next item. And we're gonna go ahead and do, um, Let's actually do the uh, item 17 and then 18, which are the two other hearings, and then we'll go to 16. So let's start with item 17, please. Report from Development Services, recommendation to receive supporting documentation into the record, conclude the public hearing and find the project uh, exempt from CEQA, declare ordinance approving a zoning code amendment to implement suggested modifications by the California Coastal Commission, read the first time and laid over the next regular meeting of the City Council for final reading, Adopt a resolution adopting amendments to the local coastal program of the general plan and adopt a resolution authorizing director of development services to submit the local coastal program amendment to the California Coastal Commission citywide. This is a public hearing and the planning manager Patricia Diefenderfer will make the presentation for this item. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members. Uh, this item is similar to a number of items you've seen recently. Uh, this item is a local coastal program amendment for zoning code amendments that were previously approved by the City Council on October 2019. As you've seen with those other recent uh, local coastal uh, program amendments, the Council has to act on the Coastal Commission's uh, suggested changes in order for these zones zoning code amendments to be effective in the coastal zone. This action would allow these amendments to be in effect in the coastal zone, these, which are, these amendments are already effect, in effect in the rest of the city. Just by way of some very quick background, the Development Services Department has undertaken a program to periodically update the zoning, uh, zoning code, a, a program known as the Omnibus Zoning Code Amendments. The goal of the program is to modernize the zoning code and ensure that the regulations are up to date, updated to be responsive to changes in development trends and best uh, zoning practices. These periodic amendments are necessary since the zoning code has not been comprehensively updated in more than 20 years and there are conflicts um, in, or, and outdated provisions throughout the code. As previously mentioned, these particular amendments were adopted by the City Council in October 2019. At that time, at the, at the time of the adoption, the City Council also adopted a resolution directing the Director of Development Services to submit, submit these ordinances to the Coastal Commission for a finding of conformance with the Certified Local Coastal Program. The City did submit the amendments uh, to the Coastal Commission, and the Coastal Commission is requiring some modifications to those amendments, and that's what's before the Council this evening. Um, the customary procedure the City Council must take an action on these uh, Coastal Commission modific suggested modifications within six months of the date of the Coastal Commission's approval, which for this item was in March of this year. If the Council approves these modifications this evening, the, coastal, uh, the local Coastal Program amendments will be resubmitted to the Coastal Commission before the deadline for final certification by the Coastal Commission. Just very quickly, I won't go over the detail or substance of these code amendments, but there were code amendments that involved um, establishing land use regulations for several uh, new uses, including escape rooms, tutoring centers, animal related uses. It established uh, and revised or clarified development standards related to the distance between structures on residential properties, parking requirements in historic landmark districts. Um, measuring fence heights in flood zones, uh, gross floor area definitions and floor, floor area ratio calculations, rooftop solar height exemptions and some other uh, development standards. It also 
um, made some modifications to administrative procedures exempting hearing items continued to a date certain from uh, re-noticing. The, these are the uh, description of the modifications that the Coastal Commission was requesting. Um, in ge generally, they require clarifying the exemption from additional parking requirements for historic properties um, undergoing residential expansion. It's precluded from use in certain parts of the coastal zone if, the, uh, if such an improvement would increase the size or degree of nonconformity with coastal resource protection and shoreline policies. It clarifies that uh, the, the new uses that are introduced in the code by these amendments are allowed by right and are consistent with the allowable uses in the adopted land use plan. It adds a requirement for properties within the certified local coastal program to prevent rooftop solar collectors from adversely impacting public views of the beach, bay, or ocean that are preserved in the certified local coastal program. It, makes a, uh, adds a footnote to development standards related to accessory dwelling units um, in the coastal zone. Notice of public hearing for this hearing was published in the Long Beach Press Telegram on July 19, 2021. Written notices were sent to the Coastal Commission. Um, other notification was provided as required by the code, including posting um, at City Hall and select libraries. On this slide is a summary of the actions that, uh, that the City Council is being um, recommended to approve, which involves um, concluding the public hearing, uh, finding the project is statutorily exempt from uh, CEQA, declaring and approving the zoning code amendments to implement the suggested modifications of the Coastal Commission and to adopt the resolution adopting the amendments to the local coastal program um, and the incorporating the modifications suggested by the Coastal Commission and uh, certifying the, the compliance with the Coastal, adopting a resolution certifying compliance with the Coastal Commission. It's March uh, 2021 action. That concludes the staff presentation. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this hearing? I believe so, correct? Mr. Mayor, this requires three votes. One for the ordinance and one for each of the two resolutions. Yes, thank you. And there's no public comment, correct? Okay, we have a motion and a second. Councilmember Ringo? Uh, no real comment other than uh, thank you to staff for updating our LCP for Long Beach. Vice Mayor Richardson? Okay. Um, can I have somebody else second that? Okay, it's a, it's, I, think it's a, I think we're fine. Go ahead and let's go ahead and take the first vote. Members, cast your vote. Councilman Mungo? First vote carries. Thank you. I'll take a motion for the second vote. Please cast your votes. Second vote carries. Thank you. And we'll take the third vote. Third vote carries. Thank you. Item 18, the next hearing. Report from Public Works, recommendation to receive supporting documentation into the record. Conclude the public hearing and adopt a resolution amending the master fees and charges schedule, District 8. For this, um, also a public hearing, we will have the Director of Public Works, Eric Lopez, and April Walker. Mr. Lopez. Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, we got before you a request to um, uh, monetize one of the lots uh, in uh, North in the North Long Beach area. Uh, the revenue from this lot uh, will be used to help us maintain uh, this this new uh, parking asset. Um, and uh, as part of that effort, uh, we're we're here to establish. We're asking for the establishment of a uh, master fee of a of a fee. Uh, the fee will be the standard one dollar uh, per hour, uh, enforced from a eight a.m. to eight p.m from Monday through Sunday. And we have uh, team members uh, on the line that can help answer any questions as well. 
That concludes the report. I think any public comment on this? There's no public comment. Councilmember Austin. Thank you. I support this item. Um, it's been a really pleasure working with our economic development team, the John Keisler, um, Oscar, uh, April, and uh, the entire team. Um, and I'm thrilled that we'll have an opportunity, number one, to, to have a, we have a new parking lot on Long Beach Boulevard in the Virginia Village area, but we will have the ability to maintain that uh, with, with those fees. And so uh, I support this and ask for your support as well. Thank you, Vice Mayor Richardson. We'll support. Thank you. Members, please go ahead and cast your votes. Motion carries. Thank you. And with that, uh, we will go to the regular agenda and we'll come back to the CIP presentation. Now we're going to go to item number 19. Item number 19, communication from Councilwoman Saro, recommendation to receive and file a presentation from John Bishop, Long Beach Medical Center to highlight new services provided at the Children's Village in the Millers Children's and Women's Hospital. Actually, I'm gonna, actually uh, we're going to go to Councilman Saro first. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Councilman Saro. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, just, I want to make sure we warmly welcome you first. Um, so I want to make sure um, we warmly welcome Chief Executive Officer, Mr. John Bishop here from Long Beach Medical Center to share with us the pediatric specialty care and medical and family support services provided at the Cherise Marie Lahir uh, Children's Village and how that has positively impacted their work as well as uh, the city of Long Beach. So without further ado, Mr. Bishop, we, we, we want to hear from you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry about the false start. Um, and, and I want to personally thank the council uh, for all the support that they've given to the hospitals and to the community through the pandemic. It's been a, an amazing period, and I think we've been a model uh, across the country. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, share with you today um, is, uh, one, something new uh, at Miller Children's and Women's, um, and, and then talk a little bit about the services we provide, because Children's hospitals, and there are only eight in California, really provide services that are different from community hospitals. And that's because we have the ability to have multidisciplinary care, where we have all the experts in one location, because uh, children are really not just small adults. They have different health care needs, and they need physicians that are specifically trained for them. Um, looks like my uh, presentation may be struggling, so. Yeah, well, we're, um, we're, they're working on it in the back. So okay, no worries, no worries. I've got most of it in my head. Uh, <laughs> I talk about uh, the Sharice uh, Marie Lalaire Outpatient Village. Uh, it opened in February, and it's really making a huge difference because it took all of our pediatric outpatient clinics, and there are many, many specialties. There's endocrinology, there's cardiology, there's surgical clinic. There's, um, there's infectious disease, and they were in, in different places around Long Beach and around um, our hospital. And that's particularly a challenge for families you know, that have really sick kids that need to see multiple specialists. They may have transportation challenges, and what we were able to do is co-locate them all in one building where you can make one call and make one appointment and have all your, your specialist needs taken care of in one location. The, if so for the families and the patients and the physicians who can now make handoffs. And if you think about the advantage of having, you know, a, a cardiologist handing over a kid to an infectious disease expert, it makes all the difference in the world to say, hey, this is what I'm seeing, um, have the lab tests available um, in one location. So it's just a tremendous uh, advancement. Um, and thank you for the city for helping us um, uh, uh, process that, that through all the approval stages. Uh, it really has been an, an amazing uh, asset to the community. Um, and then, and lastly, um, and I, I'll just save time for my, uh, I have a brief video describing what we do. You know, one thing that we've seen over the past 18 months is a lot of people have deferred their care, not just on the adult side, but parents, understandably very protective of their children, have not brought them into the hospital and until it was it was too late and they, we've seen outcomes that were very avoidable and so to the extent that you are out in the community i would ask you 
to please advocate for taking care of your children, get them the preventative care. Hospitals are professional cleaners for a living. Our hospital is a very, very safe place. If we have any COVID patients, they are in uh, effectively vacuum sealed areas with negative airflow, nothing gets out. And so please take care of not just your health needs, but the health needs of your kids, because it really, it, it breaks my heart to know that sometimes people don't get to the hospital in time because they were scared of something uh, that, was, uh, that was very preventable. And so if we could just, just do the video and I'll- Children need healthcare tailored to their unique needs, like doctors and nurses trained exclusively in pediatrics and in a kid-friendly place. That's where children's hospitals come in. About one in 20 hospitals in the U.S. is a children's hospital, making them as unique as their mission, treating infants, children, and teens. And you have one right here in your community. Memorial Care Miller Children's and Women's Hospital Long Beach is one of only eight freestanding children's hospitals in California. We are even more unique since we're one of the only hospitals in the region to have maternity and pediatric care under one roof. Our pediatric specialty physicians have gone through additional schooling and more rigorous training than a typical doctor. And since our care teams exclusively treat kids, they understand the complexities of a growing body and the need for more than medicine to get well. From broken bones to fighting against pediatric cancer, we have doctors who are experts in more than 40 types of pediatric specialties to help kids find wellness again. For some kids, specialized care starts before they're even born. Our maternal fetal medicine specialists, who are experts in high-risk pregnancies, provide care for expecting moms ensuring that both mom and baby have a healthy outcome after birth. If the need arises, our neonatal intensive care unit is just down the hall, so mom and baby can stay close together. We're one of only a few hospitals in California that provides 24-7 specialized care for moms and babies under one roof. But our mission goes beyond the walls of the hospital. From the South Bay to Orange County, we have satellite centers that bring our expert care to kids right in their own community. And no matter where they live, we help all kids grow up healthy by pioneering new vaccines, clinical trials, and treatments through national research consortiums. Knowing the future of medicine is in our hands, we partner with academic institutions across the region to ensure the doctors, nurses, and clinical leaders of tomorrow get the advanced training they need today. Because Miller Children's and Women's is a not-for-profit organization that provides care regardless of a family's ability to pay, it depends on public and private support. You can support your children's hospital by visiting millerchildrens.org give. Thank you. And in closing, I'll just say Long Beach is a big city, but it acts like a little city. You have multiple generations. You have grandparents, parents, kids, grandkids. And that is such an asset because the pride of Long Beach really makes us a special place. And so our commitment to you is to try and keep you and your children out of the hospital and, so, and give you the preventative care um, to make sure that that happens. So we call it population health and we are on the journey. Uh, thank you for your time and attention this evening. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Uh, Councilman Price. I support this item and thank you very much for the presentation. Councilman Mungo. Thank you. I just wanna thank you for what you're doing. You talk about us being a, a big city and a, a small community. I think that that is very uh, poignant. And I think that one of the things that we as a council during this economic recovery kind of discussed was um, the, the districts across our city that are really job creators, a large share of the jobs in the city of Long Beach are in healthcare. And uh, I'm sure you've heard from uh, Mr. Keisler regarding the innovation district and, and working together um, with the Economic Development Committee and Councilman Saro and the, the opportunities that we have to really um, bring people from the community into the medical field. LA County is doing a pilot project where we're taking individuals from um, disadvantaged communities and turning them into EMTs. And what does that look like after you become an EMT? Do you become a paramedic? Do you become a nurse? Do you become a, all these different things where um, you talk about getting people to go into the hospital during these times? 
it's easier when they're going into the hospital and they see a familiar face from their community. So thank you for your support and your participation in the upcoming opportunities. I've heard that you've been engaged and we really appreciate it. Vice Mayor Richardson. Thanks, uh, Councilwoman Sara, for bringing this forward. And uh, John, thanks so much for the presentation and updating us. Long Beach Memorial is just an incredible asset to, to our city. You know, both of my children were born there. One, my oldest spent a little time in that NICU. It's one of those places, you know, where you, you don't really want to go back, but you had a great experience where you're there. Those nurses are top notch and incredible. We owe a whole, we owe so much to the incredible nurses at, at Memorial Care. So I, I wasn't going to let you come up here and make a presentation without acknowledging the incredible team you have uh, at the Children's Hospital and the entire Long Beach Memorial family. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilman Sorrow. Yeah, I just want to make sure to thank you, uh, Mr. Bishop, for coming out today to giving us this presentation and sharing a little bit of an update and just proud to have you in my district and looking forward to ways in where we can continue exploring opportunities to improve. And But I, I do agree that just having um, you know, the medical offices that you mentioned in one space really provides, just saves so much time and relief for parents who are stressful. Um, and just making sure that it's accessible to the community. Um, so thank you so much again. Thank you. And I'm just going to add, you know, Mr. Bishop, it's been um, obviously uh, just really great to work with you for the, particularly the last you know, year and a half um, pretty closely uh, on um, everything related to the pandemic that we're going through. But just thank you and the entire team. I had a chance to be there at the ground rake breaking of this incredible facility. I remember it well. And just to hear kind of what was in store and now having now being able to see the, the, the finished product. Uh, it's really a spectacular building and great to see so many um, you know, clinicians and nurses and doctors uh, all in one space. And um, I think you said it best. And I just want to uh, highlight again that being able to bring all of those different specialty clinics to one to one building and it create really fosters a um, uh, an ability for folks to work together and to have most importantly, a space where parents and families can go to one building um, and receive uh, care for, for their children um, in one space. And so I think that's really, uh, really important and, and real grateful um, for Memorial for this, for this project. Uh, with that, there's a motion and a second, and there's no other public comment. So please cast your votes. Councilman Austin. Motion carries. Great, thank you. Uh, now we're going to do item 20. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. We're going to go ahead and do item number 28. Item 28, communication from Councilwoman Sorrow, Councilwoman Zindahas, Councilwoman Allen, Vice Mayor Richardson. Recommendation to request city attorney to prepare a resolution to support a fair and free union election for security guards at Common Spirit Dignity Health Facilities. Councilwoman Sorrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and first I wanna thank Vice Mayor Richardson and Council Member um, Sandejas and Allen for signing on to this item. You know, during the pandemic, we saw how valuable our frontline workers are and, and they still are. And the security guards at Common Spirit um, Dignity Health um, Facilities are part of these workers. They were on the front line day after day, standing side by side to all hospital work staff. And numerous security officers have reported, you know, contracting COVID-19 and have been also, you know, it's impacted their family um, due to inadequate equipment. Um, so this has caused many of the security guards to sign on to a petition to becoming part of SEIU. And so I fully support them in their decision in wanting a fair and free election to join SEIU UHW. And you know these security guards were some of the many heroes during the pandemic, and they should have the ability to decide um, to join a unit that's meant to improve their well-being on the job site. I also just want to share too that um, kind of out of an abundance of caution um, of the Delta variant and the nature of their work, they couldn't be present today. To, but know that they are listening and counting on us to stand with them in this fight to enjoy basic protection or in their workplace. So. Um, be, so I asked my colleagues to support this item to prepare a, a resolution to support the security guards at Common Spirit Dignity Health to have a fair and free election to join SEIU. 
Um, one point of clarification that I, I wanted to just make is, you know, on the agenda item, it doesn't it doesn't state um, uh, it, it's different from the subject of what's in my um, agenda item I submitted, and I wanted to clarify that it should be the subject is to a resolution to support security officers at Common Spirit Dignity Health to join SEIU UHW. Thank you. Thank you. And before I turn it over to Vice Mayor Richardson, I just want to make a few uh, brief remarks. So I'm very, um, very happy to, to not just uh, support this resolution, but just to say a few brief remarks also. I want to thank Councilman Saro uh, in particular for bringing this forward. Um, but I do want to share a very short story because it means personally a lot to me and I, I have a lot of um, uh, love for uh, the SEIU UHW family. And in fact, I consider myself part of, of this family. Uh, in uh, about a year before my mom passed away, uh, she actually uh, had been working at her same clinic for about almost 25 years. In the time that she worked at her clinic, uh, she was considered a low wage worker, worked very hard, uh, always went to work, rarely called in sick, uh, rarely got a raise, um, but loved her job and had a lot of integrity uh, as an immigrant woman working in her workplace. Uh, after about um, 20, 20 plus years, uh, she um, continued and continued and wanting to work at her location. I think uh, folks know that as a frontline worker, uh, my mom also unfortunately passed away to the pandemic, as do many uh, women um, uh, that are in um, spaces of, of healthcare spaces. Uh, my mom, uh, just a few months before uh, she passed, actually became a member of SEIU UHW. Uh, within the last year of her life, uh, she was approached, her and her uh, her co-workers were approached uh, and discussed the idea of actually forming and joining uh, this union. And uh, this group of six women at her workplace were very nervous to do it. They did not want to lose their jobs. <laughs> they were a little bit nervous about uh, taking a step forward and asking for a, an election for union membership. Um, but they did it. And I remember my, my mom came to me uh, and um, said, hey, you know, um, you know, Mijo, what, what, do you, what do you think? I'm really scared to do this, but um, they, they're saying that they would represent us and uh, fight for fair wages and um, represent us uh, at, 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 the, at the workplace. And my mom was the last person to ever ask for a, a, a raise. She never did because she would never do it. Um, but she thought, here is a, a, gr a group or a union that would actually advocate for her on her behalf. And so uh, a year before, uh, she, about a year before she passed, uh, she began her and these other women organizing and won an, an election at the site and became uh, the first uh, union uh, at my mom's clinic. And they were represented by SEIU UHW. And so I'm very grateful to, um, to the workers of SEIU UHW for uh, welcoming my mom. She became a very proud member of the union very quickly. Uh, and um, when I talked to these security guards at this facility, and at facilities across the state, um, folks should know that these security guards also are in a similar situation where they don't feel heard, uh, they don't feel they have representation, and, um, and in many cases are the only people on the campus that don't have union representation. And so I'm happy and proud to support uh, this organizing of these workers. Just I was proud to support my mom's organ organizing uh, at her job uh, when she took that step forward as well and was welcomed into the SAU UHW family. And so uh, as a proud member of that family, I wanna thank Councilman Saro uh, for, for this resolution and I'm very proud to support it. Vice Mayor Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Councilwoman Saro for bringing this, uh, this resolution forward. Um, certainly happy to support it. Um, you know, I, I think just over the course of the past year and a half, we've seen significant changes in our economy. and. Um, and we've talked about the K-shaped recovery, how low-wage workers are, are feeling it uh, the, the most, the, the diff most, they've had the most imp uh, significant impacts. And, but they show up every day. They show up every day. They protect us, these security officers, at very difficult times. Um, you know, when folks, you know, many of us have had the privilege of staying home and working remotely. They don't have that pr privilege as security officers. They have to step forward and do their jobs. And in this time, you know, folks are leaning, going back to what they know. Um, economy is shifting, significant impacts, 
They're going back to what they know. And what they know that works in difficult times is forming a union. They want to protect their jobs. They want to protect dignity in the workforce. So they're taking steps to do what they've never done and form a union. And I support that effort. And I think that's something that history has shown us has worked. And uh, we certainly su support those workers. In terms of, of the SEIU, I certainly appreciate the comments my, my colleagues have said. You know, I remember when I was you know, a college student at, at Cal State Dominguez Hills, my mom went back to school to be a CNA. And she worked at Huntington Memorial Hospital. And she was a SEIU HW member. And I remember the pride that she had being a, a rank and file union member and a, and a nurse's aide. And so these are very personal efforts. And so I certainly appreciate Councilwoman Saro for speaking up and saying, we're not just supporting security officers, we're supporting security officers to form a union and join SEIU UHW because that comes with a certain level of dignity and a certain level of pride. So thank you so much and I'm happy to support this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Allen. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And I also just want to say thank you to Councilwoman Saro for bringing this forward and Vice Mayor Richardson and Councilwoman Zendejas for signing on to this very important item. These workers, um, just like your mom did, Mayor, absolutely deserve the right to organize and collective bargaining. We have to make sure that these officers feel safe, valued, and taken care of. I just strongly support this item. Union jobs promote safe working uh, conditions. They help workers secure their livelihoods and they make sure um, that they are treated fairly. So thank you again, Councilman Sorrell for bringing this forward and I will be supporting this item. Thank you, Councilman Zendejas. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman Zaro, for putting this item forward. And thank you, Councilwoman Allen and Vice Mayor Richardson, also as well, for supporting this very important item. The pandemic has exacerbated inequality and unsafe working conditions for many people. And it is so important to support and stand by our workers who are speaking up on these injustices. I think creating the opportunity for workers to unionize is a step in the right direction to ensure that our residents have adequate and equitable working conditions. It is also very important to make sure that this resolution include um, the naming of the union that these, um, that these hardworking individuals have petitioned for, which is SEIU. HW, so I'm very, very happy to support this item. Thank you, I don't believe there's any public comment. So members, please go ahead and cast your votes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next up is item 20, please. Communication from Vice Mayor Richardson, Councilwoman Zendejas, Councilwoman Price, Council Austin. Recommendation to direct City Manager and the Parks, Recreation and Marine Department to explore the feasibility of a public pool to serve the North Long Beach community and return to Council with a report within 120 days. Mayor Richardson. Thank you. And um, I want to go ahead and get started. Uh, this. This proposal today is is uh, uh, really um, not the beginning of a conversation, but the beginning of an effort. Uh, we're a city that's certainly committed to, to climate, a city that's demonstrated our commitment to equity, uh, to invest in our youth. And I think this is a, 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 a bringing this conversation forward is far overdue. Uh, and I'm happy to, to do so tonight in partnership with Councilman Austin uh, and our colleagues on the city council. Uh, Council Members uh, Price and Zendeja, so thank you so much for, for supporting this effort. I think um, one of the first questions for me is, you know, where we passed the Climate Action Adaptation Plan, we see the impacts of climate change. We've, we're talking about waste and the number of things on the agenda tonight. But what does climate resiliency really look like aside from the coastal areas? What does it look like inland? Well, we know if we look at what the data says, the data says that from the you know, California interactive heat map it shows that the further away from the coast, particularly North Long Beach, are some of the hottest areas within our entire city. 
North Long Beach uh, contain, contains some of the hottest areas. More specifically, we have more days above 85 degrees in a given year than any other area of the city. Every year, it's going to get hotter. That's just a reality. And um, the reality is the people, particularly the children that live in the North Long Beach community, live the furthest away from the beach and the furthest away from pools. It's gonna get hotter. Kids are hot this summer. We need to make sure that we have the resources and we're making the investments so that uh, kids can get to a pool. Uh, there's, a, there's a video circulating on next door in North Long Beach, um, circulating on social media. You know, it's a few kids, and I'm not going to show the video because, you know, it's a little disturbing, but, you know, the neighbors have seen this video. It's just circulating around. And it's, it's, you know, it's a few kids, five or six kids. Some, you know, one of them says they live in this apartment building, and some say they don't. But they jumped the fence and went into an apartment building to go swimming. These guys have trunks on. They're having a blast. And there's an apartment manager, and he's saying, hey, you guys don't live here. You need to leave this pool. I'm going to... I'm, giving you a warning, I want to call the cops, we're going to leave this pool. Think back to myself at that age, I've jumped fences to get to a pool. When it's hot, kids are going to find a way to swim. But we have to do it in a way that it removes barriers. If you're five miles away from the nearest pool, four miles away from the nearest pool, it's difficult. If you don't have access to the boo line, access to public transit, um, it's going to be difficult to get access to a pool and you're going to have to go to, addition, go to other communities in the North Long Beach community you have public municipal pools in Lakewood that are closer to us than our own public municipal pools. Now we do have, you know, and I'm tremendously grateful for the nonprofits in North Long Beach that have provided this service for a long time. Uh, Fairfield Family YMCA, I served on the board there. Councilman Austin served on the board there. At least four council members I can think of in the recent years have served on the board there. They stepped up, done great work. It's still not a public municipal pool. They are barriers. You got pools of hope. I've served as a volunteer on their board for many, many years. Warm water, pool, accessible to the community. It's really about therapy. It's not really recreation. It's a heated pool for therapy. So most of the people there are referred by their health insurance to go do therapy. Then you have the Jordan High School pool. And we've worked through joint use for many, many years to structure it in a way that it, that it works. But we don't necessarily control that agreement. It's difficult to access. And so... In the North Long Beach community, there are significant uh, gaps. Uh, it's, transportation is a barrier. Um, you, know, you know, I look at a friend who uh, took, a, took one of those little scooters up there, right? The e-scooter up there. It takes some time to get from there to, to water. So to me, this is a climate issue. It's a neighborhood quality issue. It's a quality of life issue. It's an investing youth issue. It's an equity issue. It's time for us to you know, put a flag in the ground as city staff and what my ask is today is that we begin the process do the feasibility look at some potential locations that is feasible look at what costs may be strategies to get it as a priority in the cip funding strategies state federal local um, and present uh, some opportunities to put the council in the position to close this this long-standing gap um, and, I, and for me, that's, that's really what this is. It's an opportunity to invest in our youth, invest in recreation, um, give kids an opportunity to do something safe in their own communities. You know, I'm having a good time watching the Olympics, you know, watching these kids swimming and diving. You know, my kids take their two Barbies and we have this little pool and they're doing synchronized diving with their Barbies. It's really cool. People are interested in this, but we have to make simple aquatics basic you know accessible to every neighborhood that's what we should be doing and that's really the gist of this item so i'm happy to make this motion tonight thank you thank you councilman austin thank you and uh, i want to thank uh, rex for bringing this forward um i want to just say that i fully support this item and i know uh, many people in the north long beach uh, community have been asking for many years uh, you know why don't we have a pool um and it makes a lot of a lot of sense. A uh, couple of opportunities and options have come forward, and so um, I certainly uh, support the idea of studying a location, the best uh, location for for such a pool. I know this item was was specific to to 90805, which is a a pretty big geographic area, um, 
you know, it, it, it's going to require some some community input and as well as uh, some, some strategic uh, placement and uh, obviously assessing our, our available space um, in, in the community to put a pool in. Um, I think uh, opportunities uh, should be extended to areas of the city where they traditionally haven't been. And um, when given opportunities, young black kids and brown kids can certainly uh, rise to the occasion and take full advantage of the aquatics experience that there's a void of today. Um, on a personal note, I'm, I'm hosting a, a young college student at my home. Um, she's a water polo player at uh, women's water polo um, phenom at, at uh, Cal State Long Beach, and she's our niece. She's been involved in aquatics since she was very, very young and probably one of the few kids that looked like herself uh, playing at the level that she's playing at. But it was because she was exposed to aquatics at a young age. She learned how to swim at a young age and fell in love with the water. And so I think there's, there's opportunities beyond just recreation that can be extended. There's opportunities for college scholarships and long-term career options for, for young people. Uh, I know we talked about just the last year in our budget process, the uh, Junior Lifeguard Program. That should be extended. It should not be a, a program that is only specific to a, a certain area of the city. Let's extend those opportunities uh, throughout. I do think that there are some unique opportunities in front of us in North Long Beach and with our community partners. Um, it was mentioned that the YMCA has a pool. Uh, I, and I do serve on the board of the Fairfield YMCA, uh, full disclosure. But the YMCA is not a brick and mortar organization either. They can, they can extend and be a resource for us um, beyond their, 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 their borders. And so uh, when it comes to, to, to even our school board, our school uh, district, I think Jordan High School should be a, 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 a target for, for ongoing uh, recreation, particularly opening up that pool during these summer months. I know that was a practice for many years that we did have. We may have gotten away from it, but no matter what we are, again, we're starting a conversation today about a pool in North Long Beach. Um, we need to figure out how to bridge that gap today, right? And over the next several, I want to say a few years before we actually are able to, to get to a, a, a reality. And so, um, again, I fully support this, this item. Uh, I throw out, you know, a couple of, uh, options in 90805 that I know of, where we have a park in the dead set in the middle of the Carmelitos, a three and a half acre park that is not programmed. It's never been programmed. It's just a big green space. We need to figure out something to do there. Um, Davenport Park, I think, op uh, uh, provides options. And I know uh, Rex has been talking about uh, um, Ramona Park as, as options. We can't have these conversations without talking about where the opportunities actually are. And so, uh, again, I'm happy to support this item and, and uh, would uh, ask our colleagues to do as well. Thank you, Councilman Price. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wholeheartedly support this item. I'm super excited about this item. Um, you know, we are a beach city with a pathetic uh, access to public pools. I mean, we just don't have enough. It's not anyone's fault, no one's pointing the finger, but our, the children in this city need to know how to swim. Every single one of them needs to know how to swim. And I don't know, I know that we can't mandate that, but we, we definitely need to have more pools and provide more opportunities for it to be a norm, uh, not an exception or a special day. It just needs to be a norm. And so I, I support um, this item and I support us building more pools throughout the city, anywhere. Um, I think the opportunity for us to enhance some of our joint use agreements with the various schools that have pools is also a good opportunity for us to try to look into and take advantage of. There are a lot of uh, assets that are part of the school district and even the community college that perhaps we can try to have more access to for our communities. And I would hope that in the short term, we could look into that. Um, 
I think to me where the location of it is, it, it really, to me, I just think we should build more pools throughout the city. It doesn't really matter to me what district it is. It's more about the access that people have to those facilities. So the more we can have throughout the city, the more access people will have. And I think as a city, we're stronger together if we're trying to advocate for and obtain more city assets that all of the residents of the city can utilize regardless of district boundaries just as a city. So wherever this pool hopefully is built and goes, I think will be a welcome addition. Um, uh, Councilman Austin, you mentioned the Junior Lifeguard Program. I do wanna just give a shout out to Chief Gonzalo Medina. The reason the program can't really be extended is because it's an ocean swim program. So it has some limitations because they're teaching people how to rescue people in the ocean. But Chief Medina has done more for aquatics and equity during his eight or so years as the chief than this city had experienced for decades. The junior lifeguard program now is the highest uh, membership that we've ever had. And we have students from all over the city of Long Beach joining the program. And for those who have had children who go through the program, the initial test to become a junior lifeguard is very difficult. My own kids failed you know, multiple times before they finally were able to pass. It's really hard. So what Chief Medina did was he created a program to allow kids the opportunity to have a smoother introduction into the process so that test wasn't this hard entrance or denial it was more of a, a process and he's just done so much for the area in the area of equity and that program i'm i'm so proud of it every time i go and speak to those kids there's black brown asian white and even persian faces out there and it makes me so happy to see the diversity um, that he has brought to the program because it didn't always look like that he's done an amazing job so I think you know we use what he did as the example of incorporating aquatics into the culture of everyone throughout the city. We look at the we talked about the Olympics, the aquatics Olympians from Long Beach. It's shocking. Um, Wilson High School specifically has had so many champions go on to the Olympics, and it's something to be proud of. When we started our rowing equity program earlier this month. We had such a difficult time finding students to participate from certain parts of the city because they didn't have the basic swimming skills. And that to me was really important because they're preventing themselves from the opportunity to get college scholarships because that entry point requiring swimming is not there. So I fully support this and I think the more our students in the city know how to swim, the better it is for them in terms of opportunities. And also we think about our aging population Water sports is the best type of recreation for people that have joint muscle and back pain. And that's something that I think we really should be increasing for our senior programming as well. So I wholeheartedly support this and, and can't wait to help make it a reality. Thank you, Vice Mayor Richardson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And thanks uh, to my colleagues for the comments. Some really good things um, stood out. Um, I wanna ask uh, Tom to, to respond um, um, before I do so, I, th I think, um, some really good things that came out. I think it's important to call out, you know, race. Black and brown kids need access to a pool. This is one particular area to give that access. So I thank Councilman Austin for calling that out, and I want to underscore that. Uh, but Tom, how would you react to this uh, this direction you're receiving from Council today? I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it is clear we don't have a lot of uh, swimming access in our city compared to some other cities. Uh, we do have some great uh, assets, but there's not uh, that many of them throughout the city. So happy to look at a feasibility study. Uh, we would uh, take a look at some of the areas that were mentioned here. We'd look at both capital costs and look at a couple different parks that uh, we could put it in. Uh, we would also, we have some experience on the capital costs. There have been a couple pools in the region that have been built, so we've got some updated pricing. Uh, we also need to look at some of the operating, and I'll report back to you on, on the operating cost of a pool. Uh, I would like to explore some of the joint partnerships, if there's a, any way, because this is a, a longer-term uh, project. So uh, a project like this needs to start somewhere, and we're starting tonight, but it does take some time to get it done. Uh, and then uh, we'll get you back uh, information on the next steps, including kind of what uh, a design process might look like and 
Uh, and then uh, I think the point is to really have a project ready and able in case, you know, the funding sources open up, then uh, we'll have this uh, kind of already uh, a little bit underway. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to also, uh, I had a direction I was going to go, but since um, the city manager talked about partnerships, I think partnerships are an amazing opportunity for us. Um, if you talk about lifeguard programs, the main trainer of lifeguards in our city that is not for ocean lifeguards is the YMCA because they have so many lifeguards they need to run their pools. Um, and then I don't know what we can do to uh, find ways to provide scholarships and transportation mapping. There are very few places in the city that provide infant um, baby swim classes. And in the mom groups, there's a lot of talk about how to get to these three or four places in the city. There's one in Bixby Knowles area, there's one in the third district, and then there's one in Los Alamitos. And I, I don't think people know how to get to them even when they find where they are because the connectivity between where the classes are available and the transportation, there's just a disconnect. And so there's a lot of parental talking of what needs to be done. And I think the same is true of senior programs. You look at our senior programs, um, they're great, but they don't have pools versus the YMCAs who are all connected up to silver sneakers, which are all paid for by Medicaid, Medi-Cal, all of those that allow those senior citizens to participate free of charge. And so how we can bring those programs to any school or any pool that we provide, I think is critical. Um, and then I just also wanted to say, and while I appreciate all the wonderful athletes that come out of Wilson High School, many of which were my friends back in the 90s when I was in high school, uh, Will, I'm sorry, Millican High School put out a statistic that we've had an Olympian in every Olympics for decades. And then a, just a shout out to Max Irving on the men's water polo team, who's a Long Beach resident, and he's been doing great and scoring lots of goals in the Olympics, and we're really proud of him. Thank you. Thank you. Members, please go ahead and cast your votes. We uh, do I'm have, sorry, is there a public comment? Yes, we do. Have two speakers for public comment, Sanai Kenfei and Anna Christensen. Aren't you a Lakewood graduate? I did go to Lake. And Burnett. You got three. Burnett Millicans Austin. in my district. And it's also the most blessed two high school in the whole city. Public comment, please. I definitely took the 102 every day to go to Robert A. Millican. Um, I just think this is an amazing opportunity for pool equity. Um, when I lived in the Carmelitos, I learned how to swim at Fairfield as a infant, uh, that program, and then later got to level up when we used to have a pool here on 7th and Long Beach Boulevard, now a McDonald's and Walgreens, go figure. But that being said, uh, would love to see if this could be a plural thing. Um, I think the councilman, uh, Al Austin, made a great point with uh, referencing the empty field in the Carmelitos. Um, I think that there could clearly be some federal partnership there uh, with respect to the new uh, census coming. You know, seven, and, seven, eight, nine are going to have the highest concentration of population increase. So it's clear that that's where children are being born. Uh, the emphasis in this point of my life, at least, is children. So it's important that we have some type of uh, relationship with swimming and, and aquatics with relation to kids in these areas. Um, I think Davenport would be a great idea, Ramona, maybe uh, um, DeForest or uh, Coolidge. Um, I'm just thinking about all the places that we could, I think it's like two, three million on average. You know, I figured that, you know, uh, say again, it's a little bit more. Okay, well, let's say five million. <laughs> I know it's less than 107 million or whatever we're spending in Belmont. So that being said, like, it would just be great if we could do a plural, you know, maybe like four new parks, uh, new, new public pools in the park system. Um, it's great that we have private uh, entities that help service the, the load here, but it would be great if, uh, you know, the city could uh, take some of that financial res responsibility off their backs. So thank you. Hi, my name is Renette Maz. I'm in the Hamilton Neighborhood Association in District 9. And I do want to thank council with all the support of the youth uh, resources that you've added to our youth development toolbox in North Long Beach, the library, the youth center. We appreciate those resources very much, and I know that it's going to help 
uh, many children uh, on the right path moving forward for years to come. And I think the pool is the next step in the resources for our youth toolbox. And uh, I submitted that video. It was taken at 5500 Ackerfield. It was five or six children just playing in a pool. And I guess it had a profound effect on me because I saw children having to break the law to enjoy resources and benefits that other people in our area may take, not in our area, but in our city, in areas of our city that they take for granted. So just want to say that again. Children had to break the law, jump a fence, get threatened by the police to play in a pool. And that area at 5500 Ackerfield is very close to Ramona Park. Um, this neighborhood or this apartment building has had these break-ins consistently for years. And I don't know how police would feel having to go and arrest kids for playing in a pool, but it's, it's embarrassing that we don't have these resources in our neighborhood so that these kids have a place to go play, have fun, and it's public accessible easy accessible. I know, and I, and I can speak for myself, um, being a single mother years ago, I barely had enough money for a gallon of milk, let alone bus fare to a pool miles away. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And please cast your votes. No. We have one more speaker, Anna Christensen. I only have two speakers on here, so. No, no. That was my mistake. We missed um, Miss. I'm sorry Masa. I turned it a slip. It's okay. Go ahead. I, just, I only had two. Please it's go ahead. Just, I think this always happens with us. It's always a little stress moment. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we're all here together on unceded Tongva land. Good to be here. I have to pinch myself. I can't believe I'm hearing this. This is the great, so great. I really appreciate all the council members that spoke today, and especially Mr. Richardson for introducing this resolution. Um, Long Beach Area Peace Network in our, uh, everybody in the pool program has been advocating for community pools. And I think it's really very important to acknowledge David's words from the Books and Buckets program. Why, what if I didn't have to take that bus? And you know, as well as the kids that came up here, our skateboard program, and that's what my son said. There's skate parks all over Long Beach. It should be the same with, with pools. and. And whereas basketball and skateboarding are phenomenal sports, swimming is more than a sport. It's a life-saving activity that everybody needs if you live near a large body of water. So this is basically clearly a public safety issue, and not just for kids, but for adults. So I really appreciate, um, it's just beyond, beyond words. This is so important, and it's so good to have the community coming together, our representatives coming together around this this matter. And uh, I did s send the sponsors some information. USA Swimming Facilities Management is partnering with Total, Total Aquatics Programming. And they present, and they did back in the day, and they offered to share this information with the city if we could only get to Denver. Well, they have been presenting virtual conferences and information, not only on building community pools, but also on maintaining them and, and having them be sustainable. So I really, once again, re highly recommend that we get out of our, our Long Beach bubble and reach out to the experts in both sending people to the Olympics, but also providing equitable public facilities and well-designed and that we, we include, I would love it if you'd amend the resolution to include funding, but, I, I, uh, but at least consider funding uh, city council members and staff who could co attend these conferences at least access the webinar. Um, I just want to say that I, even though I don't, blame is not, uh, is not that valid, I mean, it might be valid, but it's not that valuable, but that we do have a history of racism, we do have a history of classism, and we share it with a lot of people in the world, right? A lot of communities. So how do we become a more equitable and a less racist community? We have a, we had a plan. We had a plan that our, our healthy communities plan that said we will put new recreational facilities in underserved communities. So not to add, end on a negative note, but I think 
this pool must be prioritized over funding the BPAC. Safety competition. before competition. Thank you. Thank you. Please cast your votes. Motion carries. Okay, thank you. We're going to hear the next few items uh, here. I know 23 has a presentation, uh, 20, but 24, 25, and 26, I don't think do not. So let's go ahead and item 24, please. Report from Human Resources, recommendation to approve letter of agreement with the International Association of Machinists and Aerospace Workers to revise salary ranges for communications officer and port communication specialist citywide. There's a motion and a second. There's no public comment. Members, please cast your votes. Motion carries. Item 25, please. Report from Long Beach Airport, recommendation to award a contract to Walsh Construction for reconstruct taxiway L project at the Long Beach Airport, District 5. Okay, there's a motion and a second. There's no public comment. Members, please cast your votes. Motion carries. 26. Report from Public Works, recommendation to authorize city manager to amend 16 agreements for as needed construction management and inspection services for public works projects to increase the aggregate contract amount by 10 million citywide. A motion and a second, no public comment. Please cast your votes. Councilman Austin, motion carries. Item 30. Communication from city attorney, recommendation to adopt the minute order to grant an application from Mary L. Johnston for a widow's pension. I get a motion and a second, please. And there's no public comment. Please cast your votes. Motion carries. Thank you. That concludes the agenda. Now we are going to go back to our budget presentation and our hearing. Budget presentation, please, Madam Clerk. So report from financial management, recommendation to conduct a budget hearing of the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget for the capital improvement program citywide. Mr. Modica. Thank you. This is our second um, budget hearing. And traditionally on this day, we go through um, the uh, capital improvement program. So the first day we normally give the uh, overview of the entire budget. And then uh, now we're starting to dive a little bit deeper. Uh, we have a robust capital improvement plan. We know how important infrastructure is to all of you and your residents. Uh, so we will have Eric Lopez go through that. Uh, we are planning to have a uh, more focused study session just on infrastructure and kind of our longer term infrastructure later in the month. Uh, and so uh, we'll be talking about that a little more as well. If I can turn now to Eric. Thank you, Tom. Honorable, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, so I'm here tonight to present to you our proposed fiscal year 22 CIP budget. Um, I, to our residents present here today, or those watching from home, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I wanna begin by uh, first uh, just highlighting some of the great work that the Public Works team uh, has completed this current uh, fiscal year. Uh, so we have some pictures to demonstrate uh, that work. On the top left-hand corner, we have our new Granada Beach concessions stand and play area. Uh, uh, to the right of that, we have our new Atlantic Farms Bridge Community Center, our first year-round shelter that opened this fiscal year. We're actually going to um, pause one second. Sure. I think we did not do 23, so I want to I, I do all the agenda items first. So if I can have the clerk please read item 23, please. It'll be a quick vote. Report from financial management, recommendation to adopt a resolution authorizing city manager to execute a contract with Periscope Holdings, Inc. for procurement technology solutions citywide. There's a motion and a second. Is there public comment? Not on this item, no. Mr. Modica, did, I, I, I don't know that we, we have all the, the agenda. Did you want to make a presentation or were you? We fine? do. This is a pretty significant effort uh, to really reform purchasing. Uh, we've been working on this for a couple of years, and I hear from a number of you about how important purchasing is. So we were planning to take about seven minutes to go through a presentation on yeah, that's fine. the new that's system and what we're doing. Let's do it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. I will introduce uh, Sandy St. Palmer, uh, our deputy director. 
Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Thank you for this opportunity to provide you with information about the Department of Financial Management's proposed procurement technology purchase, along with how it fits into our work to make over procurement in Long Beach. With me tonight are Michelle Wilson, Long Beach's uh, purchasing agent, and Augusta Goodman, our project manager. ePro at its core will manage our prospective vendor database, provide an online platform for competitive solicitations like our invitations to bid and request for proposals, help us manage our small, local, and disadvantaged business data, assist with important contract management tasks, and help with reporting. Our Purchasing and Business Services Manager, Tara Mortensen, was not able to be here tonight. Under her excellent direction, the Purchasing Division has worked for the last several years to evaluate and greatly improve its operations and citywide procurement in response to City Council, City Leadership, and City Auditor requests. And EPRO is an integral part of the extreme procurement makeover happening in Long Beach to make procurement more inclusive and responsible. There are many aspects involved in this comprehensive program update, and Michelle will be walking you through a few highlights to provide some insight about how tonight's decision fits into that larger body of work. Thank you, Sandy, and good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. In prior year's updates, we've provided you with information about critical program improvements, such as streamlining insurance requirements and better categorization of vendors. Reform accelerated in 2020 with the kickoff of what we are calling our extreme procurement makeover. This is a deliberate and comprehensive remaking of the city's procurement operations. We are evaluating our policy, process, and practice to increase equity and access for vendors, enable better outcomes in our contracts, and to make things more efficient and strategic. Our extreme procurement makeover is enhanced by our partnership with Harvard Kennedy School Government Performance Lab, also known as GPL. GPL has a highly sought after fellowship program with hands-on technical assistance specifically in public procurement. They provide dedicated resources for change along with access to their research and prior results. Through their work across the country, including recent projects in Boston, Chicago, and Los Angeles, GPL is well positioned to support us with the implementation of national industry best practices. Long Beach was seen as being on the cutting edge of a national movement for ambitious procurement reform. Building our, on our success in year one, GPL has taken the rare step of assigning us not only one, but two full-time fellows to support an expanded scope of work in year two, which was approved by city council just a few weeks ago. One of our first steps was to formalize our guiding values, goals, and metrics into a simplified strategic plan. We use national best practices from industry organizations and GPL, as well as important goals and principles from everyone in the Framework for Reconciliation, and the City's Equity Toolkit. This document guides our procurement reform, and we hold it to use ourselves accountable for making procurement more inviting, equitable, efficient, and impactful. Another pillar of our reform was a complete renovation of our request for proposals. This document, which is one of the primary tools the City uses to select vendors for medium or large dollar purchases, is now easier and more inviting to the business community. Clearer description of city needs lowers barriers to entry and better positions small, local, and disadvantaged businesses to submit proposals and ultimately to be awarded opportunities. We've been meeting with departments to enhance planning efforts as well. Procurement forecasting will allow city staff to do more and better local outreach for procurement opportunities, particularly important for disadvantaged vendors. It also allows us time to better partner with city stakeholders like the Department of Economic Development and the Business License Division to better coordinate efforts to help the local business community to have greater impact on the Long Beach economy. Our work this year has largely been internally focused to lay a strong foundation and we are now able to pivot and look outward. We will focus on inclusive procurement trends and three key strategies, increasing accessibility to government contracting, improving engagement with the business community, and building capacity for vendors to compete for city business. Weave throughout our makeover plans is the use of a new procurement management platform, ePro, which brings us back to the item before you tonight. And I will pass it to Augusta. Thank you and good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. ePro will assist us in three critical areas and the first is lowering barriers. The system is approachable and easy to use and will help us bridge the digital divide. 
We will expand our language access options and over time be able to help staff better source small dollar purchases from Long Beach businesses. Contract management tools will aid vendor relationships, improve contract outcomes, and improve compliance to contract terms. This will address some of the city auditor's concerns regarding contract management. And finally, EPRO will help us make data-driven operational decisions and better answer questions about the economic impact of the city's dollars. It will help us track vendor diversity goals, support us while we continue to identify additional barriers, and provide tools of, for analysis of procurement trends in the city. And I will pass back to Michelle. Before we conclude, I'd like to take a moment to celebrate one final success with you. We just learned this past week that we won for the second year in a row a national achievement in excellence in procurement. We were one of only 70 cities to be recognized and only five other cities that were longer, larger than Long Beach. The review process for this award was extremely comprehensive. The criteria were designed to measure innovation, professionalism, productivity, e-procurement, and leadership attributes of the procurement organization and included components from the great work the team has done to support COVID-19 pandemic emergency response and recovery efforts. Procurement in Long Beach has changed and improved greatly over the last several years. We are becoming a national leader and even more change and improvement is still to come. The ePro software before you tonight is an important part of that overall improvement. Thank you and this concludes our presentation and we are available for any questions. Thank you, Councilman Mungo. Thank you. I want to thank the staff and the team. Uh, contract management systems have been a consistent reporting issue in all of the city auditors reports and uh, having tools available that automate and ensure timely practices in a city of our size, especially with the turnover and um, opportunities for people to advance within a local government. Uh, you have staff that move before the term of a grant or a contract has expired. And it's unrealistic to think that a paper-based system is going to be able to be viable in today's day and age when so much of what we do is on the computer. So I just wanna thank you for ensuring that that was a big part of this. Uh, the only comment I have on the presentation besides the fact that it was excellent is that you talk about low dollar contracts to local vendors. Um, and again, most of the time recently, I haven't had to make comments on vendor selection because since Councilwoman Allen has joined the council, she's really taken the charge on that. And so I would just be repeating her comments. Uh, but consistently, it's not just low dollar contracts. I mean, there are times where we're buying a million dollars in tires from outside of our city. And that extra two cents of sales tax revenue is something that we need to compute into that bidding process of that additional value to us as a city. So. Um, I just want to make sure that's not just for low dollar value. We need to talk about the local jobs and other things that are viable. And a, a factor of that that I think we found to be particularly impactful during the pandemic is the number of local Long Beach residents that are employed by a, a particular company. I think the more people in our city that they employ at a fair wage um, is a, a big impact. Thank you. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor Richardson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So on uh, first, thanks uh, to staff for this presentation. More importantly, thanks for the context in which you presented this presentation. It's been an ongoing conversation within the city about how we can uh, diversify and leverage our purses and power to create local jobs, local economic input. Um, and we always run into two barriers. One, our software is not designed in a way where we can easily point to and identify where the opportunities are or quantify how much we're actually spending in certain departments in certain areas. And then secondly, it's hard, hard to, to coordinate when you see you have a harbor department, you've got an airport, you've got different departments who have maybe different processes and, and in implementing this allows a reset and be, begins to allow us to set some goals. Um, particularly, I'm gonna go back and do a refresher. So back in 2017, we adopted the Everyone In Plan and it asked us to begin to get to a point where we can start setting a goal. LA County has a target of 10% of all procurement uh, targeted social enterprises, minority businesses, women owned businesses. Um, more specifically, the recommendation is increase this percentage of city of Long Beach spending on local, small and diverse businesses by establishing a streamlined certification process, integrated vendor database and for Long Beach agencies and, in, and institutions and transparent supplier participation goals. 
Public procurement is one of the most powerful tools that local governments can deploy to foster more equitable Long Beach economies. That's a standard Long Beach City Council already adopted. And then last year, in terms of the framework for reconciliation, uh, the framework calls on the city under goal one to ensure budget, contracting, and procurement processes intentionally and equity, equitably address past and present impacts of systemic racism and build positive futures for those most impacted. It calls for the creation of a resource and support center for new and small businesses to help them get started, participate and succeed in city procurement opportunities. It talks about upgrading technology to provide online versions of, versions of that center. It also talks about uh, creating and implementing policies and associated programs in addition to uh, the technology uh, up updates that help our city ensure that contractors, vendors, and consultants embrace and reflect the city's diversity. That means the outreach associated with the software, uh, the training and the education in our communities to make sure people know how to use the software and simplifying our processes for participating in city procurement, including adjusting insurance requirements and simplifying and reducing required forms. All of these things uh, have been uh, voted on and direction has been given to make them a priority, um, ensuring that we have an equitable procurement system. What I see today with this adoption of this system makes all of these goals, it, we're one step closer to making it a reality. And I think that's what's important here today. And so thank you so much. I'm proud to support this. And I look forward to the follow-up and you know, what the next steps look like in leveraging this to achieve those goals that we talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Allen. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. I am uh, super excited to, about this presentation. Um, as someone in my previous life who has responded to hundreds of RFPs throughout the state, Planet Bids is not fun. It's, it, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, wasn't fun as a vendor and it had a lot of, of problems. So I look forward to seeing this, um, this rolled out. Um, I also, um, th there are several questions that I have, so maybe we can do uh, s some of this um, offline, but just making sure um, that, you know, the outreach is important, but also that um, we are uh, tracking, um, you know, how those awards are, are given on the system. Um, right away. And then um, also I've had problems in the past with Planet Bids where people were uh, awarded uh, contracts that weren't um, registered on Planet Bids. And um, I think the city has fixed that, but there's just, um, there, this is just really um, exciting for our local businesses. And uh, I just look forward to uh, seeing this rolled out. So thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any public comment? No public comment. Okay, then we will go ahead and cast a vote. Thank you. Councilwoman Allen. Motion carries. Thank you. We will go ahead and now go back to the budget hearing. Okay, Eric. Okay, let's try this again. So I was going through some of our accomplishments and uh, thanking the team uh, that worked really hard to deliver uh, our current FY21 uh, projects and investments. So I just wanted to highlight a few of those projects um, and, uh, and just pay a tribute to our very hardworking uh, team members uh, that make these a reality. Uh, so I talked about Granada uh, and the um, and our Atlantic Farms Bridge Community Housing Project. Uh, next to that, we have a, a playground uh, renovation that we did at El Dorado Park uh, Golden Grove, and uh, that was uh, one of a couple of uh, improvements. Uh, below that, to the in the middle of the of the slide, we also have an, an improved. A golden uh, show, Golden Grove uh, outdoor event center that we were able to renovate. Uh, great space for outdoor um, events. 
Uh, then uh, to the bottom left, uh, we have one of our many uh, street improvements. Um, and then to the, the bottom uh, right hand corner, we have uh, one of many, many curb ramps uh, that we were able to complete this year. Over, overall, um, we are proposing a total um, capital improvement program investment of 146 million. Um, we uh, this consists of a major of a variety of different sources uh, that are all listed on this slide. Um, the investment in our CAP this year is an enhancement uh, from from last year, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that in future slides. Within our capital improvement program budget, we split it up into different uh, categories. Uh, we call these investment categories, and uh, as you can see uh, from the chart, the largest investments uh, this year are being made within our mobility program, our public facilities program, and our utilities program. Uh, for the airport, um, in, for the airport in FY22, uh, we are uh, pro proposing an investment in improvements for accessing the terminal and for rehabilitation of the airfield runways. Uh, the uh, total proposed budget for this uh, program is uh, 1 million. Within our beaches and marinas program, uh, we're proposing an investment of 1.75 million um, spread about uh, various uses. Uh, we're actually going to highlight some of the projects within this program in the later slide. Uh, we put all the Titans projects together uh, in a slide so that we can uh, share some of those uh, proposed projects. The mobility program represents one of the uh, larger investments. Um, we are looking at uh, investing a total of $60 million in our city's roads, alleys, sidewalks, and curb ramp improvements. Um, a lot of this funding comes from uh, not just local sources, but also from state and, and county sources, including gas tax, SB1, Measure R, Measure M, Prop A, and Prop C. In uh, some of the um, examples, we just wanted to show an example of a, of a local uh, street improvement project, the before and after. Uh, the, uh, these, uh, these projects uh, truly do make an immediate impact uh, within our uh, residential neighborhoods and our, just our city overall uh, that um, we are very proud of. Um, I also wanted to show a before and after of uh, one of our curb ramp uh, improvements. Um, and in our effort to improve accessibility, we've actually been able to implement over 600 curb ramps uh, this year alone. That's on top of uh, thousands of others that we've been able to uh, uh, complete in the last few years. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, we've been talking about dirt alleys uh, for a while and uh, we're getting to the point where we're addressing just about all of our dirt alleys. Uh, here we have a before and after uh, representation of, a, of an alley that's been repaved and just a significant um, um, change uh, from, from one to the other. Overall, in our mobility program, we're looking at, um, at $59.79 million uh, in, in, um, in investments. Um, we laid out the sources on, on the left chart um, and the uses on the right. Those are the different categories that represent one or a, a multitude of projects uh, within uh, those uses. Um, as uh, for our uh, for our local street programs, or actually our top uh, three uh, investments, um, or let me talk about top four investments uh, this year uh, that are being proposed is for our arterial corridor enhancements program our arterial street rehabilitation, residential street improvements, and our ADA curb ramp improvements. Uh, those uh, four major uses represent a, a majority of the investments as part of the mobility uh, program within our CIP. Um, Every year we make progress on the um, uh, infrastructure investment plan uh, that was unveiled in FY17, FY18. Um, this, we, when we started on our plan, um, uh, at least the streets and roadways uh, section does a plan, this was all red. 
And every year as we complete segments, uh, we start converting them into green. And as we work on improving those, um, they, they start uh, converting. So we made a lot of progress, uh, but there's still a lot of work uh, to do. Uh, the remaining red lines are projects that we still need to uh, fund and complete. Um, and uh, on the right hand chart, I sh uh, demonstrate the uh, progress we made on our major streets, residential streets and alleys uh, programs. So a lot of good progress, uh, but some, uh, some work remains that the team is working extremely hard on. For uh, residential streets, our residential streets program is actually one of our uh, one of our more um, um, busy and and I'm gonna say uh, effective programs. We have a great residential uh, street team that's every year uh, f um, finishing segments um, that are consistent with our uh, investment uh, plan. So um, we continue our our work. Um, at this point, a lot of our um, FY21 uh, residential streets are already designed and programmed for construction and our engineers are focusing on the next set of streets and planning and designing and getting them ready for construction at FY22. Within our parks uh, program, uh, we're proposing an investment of 1.6 million um, spread, uh, th spread across uh, three different categories. And for our public facilities program, we're proposing an investment of 21.6 uh, million. Um, and we have a variety of sources that comprise this amount. And uh, two main uh, uses are our facility improvements and our energy efficiency improvements. And I'm actually gonna highlight uh, some of these projects. Um, so for public facilities, we have um, listed uh, we have proposed uh, specific projects for this year, our Police Department Academy building um, renovation, our Queen Mary uh, improvements, critical infrastructure reserves, citywide EV charging, city-owned solar, uh, energy efficiency retrofits, and, and the others listed on this chart. For our utility program, um, the largest investments are made for water and gas and sewer infrastructure, but we also have Measure W. And Measure W um, revenue uh, this year for capital improvements, it's, um, it's, it's gonna be $3 million for FY22. And um, as you know, Measure W was passed by the voters in November of 2018, and has been identified to be used to construct new stormwater devices that clean water. Uh, one, one of our uh, primary examples of such projects are eligible for Measure W projects is the LB Must treatment facility. And we show a couple pictures uh, of that project uh, within, within the slide. Um, also wanted to note that our Long Beach Energy Resources Department is proposing an $11 million investment to the city's pipeline infrastructure. And, the, our, and our Long Beach Water Department is proposing a $46.8 million investment to our city's water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, wanted to highlight uh, some uh, projects within our uh, Tidelands uh, CIP and uh, program and, and just AB32 funding. Um, wanted to show a recent project on the left hand si side of this slide that we recently completed, uh, solar um, installation, solar canopies. We're doing more solar now than we ever have and, we're, and we look to continue uh, that investment. Uh, to the right, uh, a Tidelands project that we wanted to highlight is the junior lifeguard facility that we are proposing to rebuild and we are um, as, uh, targeting to start construction this uh, coming fiscal year. Uh, for our Tidelands funded projects, I listed those projects in, in the chart uh, to your right. Um, we have a, a great number of really exciting projects that are being planned, designed, or constructed. Um, there, as as you know, Tidelands funds is a um, is a source that can only be used within a certain geography, uh, state defined uh, Tidelands areas within within our city. Um, so um, when we have available Tidelands funds, uh, we we investment within those uh, defined Tidelands zones. For AB32, um, we've been um, we've been investing on our citywide EV charging infrastructure. Uh, that uh, investment is uh, set to continue in uh, fiscal year 22. 
um, as is our investments in citywide solar and energy efficiency improvements at our city facilities. We're, all, we're also looking at making some LED upgrades into the Queensway bridge uh, lighting, and we're looking at investing in our uh, partnership uh, with SEE to uh, really encourage uh, more people to uh, transition to green energy uh, uh, sources and to take advantage of a lot of the programs that exist out there that just some people don't know about. Um, AB 32 is, is, um, is, uh, represents the city of projects that, um, that Public Works has been focusing on, especially in the last year. And we have a great team that's doing a just amazing job of delivering uh, these projects. So uh, thank you to that specific team as well. Now, I want to take a moment and highlight uh, Measure A and the investment it has uh, allowed in our city's infrastructure. Everyone uh, should be familiar by now with our uh, infrastructure investment plan. Um, we've been able to, um, to uh, complete um, just over 70% of all the uh, committed projects, and uh, we're working hard to uh, complete the remaining uh, ones. Um, what the projects that we're looking at completing uh, this, uh, this, uh, this next year include the North Health Facility, uh, the Alamitos Branch Library, our El Dorado Park Artificial Turf Field and our Recreation Park uh, Playground, uh, just to name a few. Um, and these uh, Measure A projects are, are, are all uh, underway and uh, very exciting to have the opportunity to deliver them. Um, I, I did want to add a note that we are currently working on the next uh, five-year infrastructure investment plan. And uh, we're, we're uh, planning to uh, come back to this body and present some of the details um, a big part of that, obviously, is the ex anticipated federal funding, and uh, we want to talk about funding strategies uh, to address uh, some of the needs. And I will get into some of our needs uh, in, in a couple of slides. Um, measure A uh, accomplishments, uh, we continue to be able to do a lot with the funding that's approved uh, each year under Measure A, uh, from community centers to street improvements to uh, park improvements and even um, stairways and uh, uh, accessible pathways uh, within a park system. Um, we've also uh, continued to deliver uh, playgrounds and uh, more curb ramps and, uh, and facility improvements. Uh, the most recent playground that we completed with Measure A funding is the Cherry Park Playground that we were happy to unveil uh, just a couple weeks ago. The FY22 Measure A proposed budget, um, our our, we're recommending to uh, allocate $6.3 million uh, to the mobility program, $1.2 million to the parks program, and $14.13 million to the public facilities program, uh, which represents a total Measure A investment of $21.63 million. Our, our investments uh, continue um, to at uh, various um, specific projects. Uh, we mentioned the uh, PD Academy er earlier, but we're also making investments to Fire Station 9, um, some of our uh, facilities that with, with needs that have been identified in our facility conditions assessment, uh, curbs and, and sidewalks, our arterial streets programs, um, 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 alleys, and, uh, and many, many other more enhancements. Since the inception of Measure A in 2017, um, we invested uh, a total, uh, including the FY22 proposed budget, we're, we're lo looking at an overall investment of just under $160 million. And it's truly hard to imagine where we would be at without this funding source and without them the uh, many projects that Measure A has really allowed us to uh, propose, plan, design, and deliver. Total uh, estimated investments, uh, we, we do uh, have some projects uh, that are that will require additional funding so that we can complete our commitments within the uh, spending plan uh, for Measure A, and we're working hard on those. Um, I wanted to spend just a moment on our unfunded needs. And um, as Tom mentioned uh, earlier, we will be having a study session where we'll get deeper into some of these needs, uh, funding opportunities, and uh, potential strategies for funding. So um, 
bo bottom line, we have more needs uh, in our city than we have available budget. And every year we try to balance our needs and available budget and, and really push forward projects that, um, that are ready. Um, and also, uh, I think we, we do work really hard to uh, try to um, bring in additional state and federal funding. And we're excited about the opportunity to be able to continue to do that to address some of our many, many, many unfunded needs. Um, challenges and opportunities that we've identified. Um, we do have our, our new pavement management program. Um, it's been revised. We're uh, working to release uh, the information and the maps uh, with the uh, with the latest and greatest information on our streets. Having that uh, data uh, is going to be key in helping us uh, plan, program, and execute uh, the the ne the, our, the many street improvements that 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 are in the works. Um, we we do have the ADA settlement agreement that we continue to um, focus on, and we're working really hard to make sure we meet all our commitments. Um, we also have the benefit of our con facilities conditions assessment and um, and the uh, and the data that allows us to evaluate our investments within our facility that we didn't have before. Um, so we're looking at releasing those final reports uh, later uh, this year and, and to updating those reports uh, every 10 years so that we know exactly what the conditions of our facilities are and we can use that information um, uh, wisely. Um, Measure W investment plan. Um, Measure W has been a, a really beneficial uh, funding source. Uh, we continue to program uh, the investments to help with stormwater water quality enhancements, and uh, we're working on 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 our investment plan that we can use uh, to guide us uh, throughout um, the next few years. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, the next infrastructure investment plan. Uh, does lean heavily on uh, state and federal funding, uh, which we are expecting and hoping uh, that those uh, funds are um, significant so it can truly help us make a impact in uh, addressing some of our many needs. So uh, that concludes the staff presentation and we're ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Is there any public comment on this? There is one public comment, and I can fay. There is no more public comment on this item. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I turn this over to the council, I just want to have a couple comments. Um, first, I want to thank um, the public works team and uh, Mr. Lopez for putting together a, a good CFP presentation. Always does. And um, I want to just add how um, I know I, I say this almost every year that in, you know for me this. The CIP and the infrastructure work is, is some of the most important work that we do every year. And I think there are very few things um, for, for most of the folks that I talk to that, uh, that rank higher oftentimes than um, please fix my street or please replace uh, my kid's playground or uh, please uh, take a look at the alley. Um, these are the kind of bread and butter issues that we as a community, as a council should be focused on consistently is how we're producing for our residents as it relates to playgrounds for their kids, streets for them, streets that are safe, sidewalks for, uh, to walk down in their neighborhood, trees that are trimmed. Uh, and I'm just really glad that we're making progress, uh, even though we know the need is, is so great. I just also wanna just add that, um, once again, uh, I wanna just uplift, like I, like I try to do every year, just the importance of, of Measure A, and you see it throughout your presentation. The investment that voters made now twice uh, is transforming uh, the city and has led to more investments in infrastructure than, than has happened in the last generation. So that's something we should be proud and celebrate and would not be possible without uh, the people of this community who now twice have, um, have, now have invested back into, into their city. Want to note um, one of there's a lot of in investments that I appreciate that happen. I'm focused on a few things. The first is that map. I think we've obviously made a we made a commitment to the voters to get that map done, and I know we're almost there. And so I look forward. I, I believe in a month or two from a month or two from now we're going to have a study session specific to infrastructure and about kind of what's next. I understand, 
I know that the, the Council Committee on Infrastructure is also, uh, I think, digging in and, and doing some of this work. And so I look forward to that conversation um, and I look forward to finishing that map, which is an important commitment we made to the community. Also want to note that uh, there, are, there are a few things that I enjoy more than replacing or installing new playgrounds. I believe that in the last few years, we have probably replaced or installed close to maybe 10 playgrounds uh, using Measure A funds. Uh, they range from smaller playground sets to these just enormous, uh, incredible new playground sets that we put in at places like Los Cerritos Park and uh, Drake. Uh, uh, we just opened one at Cherry Park with Council Maria Renga uh, just a few weeks ago, all Measure A funded. And I want to encourage you, Mr. Lopez, and your team that as we plan for the future beyond the CIP, but the next five years to prioritize playgrounds for kids in this community. And there's very few, um, very, there's very few uh, things that we do where I get more positive feedback from parents and neighbors than when we put in a new playground in their park. And so I just, I'm hoping that that is a big focus for us uh, moving forward. I also want to just note for the council that we have an enormous opportunity in front of us with this infrastructure bill that is getting bipartisan support in the U.S. Senate and in the House. Uh, I've been um, somewhat involved in it uh, as a advocating on, on with throughout through the U.S. Conference of Mayors and, and some of the conversations we're having with the White House and, and some of the, uh, the, the, the infrastructure, infrastructure groups. I, had a chance to participate with, with Secretary Buttigieg on some talks uh, uh, for, for the Port of Long Beach and getting resources there. We're coming up with uh, um, uh, some, some asks as it relates to, to road money and street money and playground money. And I think what's really critical is that we have an opportunity to get probably the largest federal investment in infrastructure than we've also had in a generation. And including in that, Will be, also, will be infrastructure investments that we've never had at, at, at levels um, around public transit, around uh, broadband, which, uh, closing the digital divide, uh, around um, some, some climate infrastructure, uh, and the very basics uh, that we need in this community around roads, uh, bridges, uh, 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 ports, airports. So we're, gonna, we're about to see a massive infrastructure investment in Long Beach and in, across the country. And I plan to be very involved and engaged in ensuring that we get that across the finish line, but then also making sure that we are investing it um, in, in, in where, we, where it needs to go in the city. And I would encourage us as a council, there's a lot of, um, a lot of items that come before us and a lot of um, interests, I think, on this body for, for issues. But I would challenge us that, we should, that, that this issue around infrastructure, uh, we should spend a lot of time talking about and investing uh, the time that I think our residents uh, uh, are asking of us. This is a huge issue. And so I'm really looking forward to these next few months where it's all going to be about infrastructure and how we spend those resources. So thank you, Mr. Lopez, for, for the presentation. And uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Modica, also for, um, for making sure that we're getting these Measure A dollars uh, put in place. Councilman Austin. Thank you, and uh, I think you guys have uh, almost said all that I wanted to say, but not quite. <laughs> um, I do want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Lopez for a great presentation. Um, it's always encouraging to see that we have uh, the opportunity to invest in our infrastructure in the city. This year it was $146 million, um, and that's going to keep people work, working, but also uh, it's going to do a lot of good in, in our city. Um, you know, I think the mayor, mayor summed it up. I think we all are sitting on the edge of our seats um, and anxiously awaiting um, information coming from D.C. around the infrastructure bill that is uh, matriculating through Congress right now. And uh, obviously how we plan and what we, what we do in the future um, will, will be driven by that quite a bit. Um, you know, I, I too love playgrounds. Um, 
but I, I honestly, I think if you talk to, to many of uh, the residents in our, in our city, you know, the, the pulse is, is around uh, residential streets and alleys. Um, that work is, is transformational. That work is greatly appreciated. Uh, and, and obviously there's still a lot of need in the city. Measure A was a great shot in the arm and it gave us the ability to, to actually be working toward <laughs> um, improvement, but it's not enough. And, and so um, I, I'd like to, and when we get to that point, have that, that conversation. Um, and you know, I'm gonna be a, a hard advocate and throwing down the gauntlet to make sure that you know, every street, every neighborhood in uh, this, this city is, is a place where everybody is proud to live, right? No matter where they live um, in, in this, the city, um, all neighborhoods, all, ma all communities matter. And, and uh, I think uh, whenever I can see residential streets, curbs, um, sidewalks, alleys uh, being repaired, um, I know that I'm doing tangible work that's gonna make a difference for the long-term um, interest of our city. So um, I, I would uh, make those comments, but understand that, that that's where I'm gonna be coming from um, for, for uh, the foreseeable future when it comes to infrastructure dollars. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, um, obviously digging into the rest of uh, the, the budget presentations that we have, but to the, um, the team, the staff, Mr. Lopez and the entire public works team, I just wanna Hey, on behalf of the residents of the 8th District, and I know many, many others, thank you for, for the aggressive work that you guys are doing. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilman Mungo. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, Eric knows my favorite topic of all time is uh, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. I have to agree with uh, Councilmember Austin that the pulse on the street is streets. Streets and sidewalks, streets and sidewalks. And playgrounds are great, and I have a two-and-a-half-year-old, and playgrounds are fantastic. Um, and I love meeting all the other moms and dads at the playgrounds, but when I'm at the playgrounds, the complaint I hear from parents is my kid can't bike on the sidewalks because they're so broken in our neighborhoods. And so I think that there's this intermediary and it's interesting to hear the parents because like when a sidewalk's cracked a little bit, it's difficult for a child to walk on and to learn to scooter on and so on. But when the si sidewalk is cracked a lot, it's now become a skate ramp. And so while the neighbor kids all love it, the person whose house it's in front of does not. And the fact that I have multiple skate ramps in 90808 that are in excess of nine inches from where they initially started um, is just a testament to why we have $600 million in sidewalk need. And sidewalks are health, sidewalks are seniors, sidewalks are children, sidewalks are everybody. And during the pandemic, I know we saw people walking more than ever before. Um, and to continue that, we really need to provide an inviting place to walk. I would even say the one thing I miss most about living in the seventh district was the width of the sidewalks. The sidewalks on the seventh district are two squares wide versus one rectangle, and that makes it a more enjoyable family walk at night. And so as we discuss and implement uh, sidewalk repairs, I think that's something important to consider. Um, this report is great. I think it would be interesting to dive into at the infrastructure committee, the determination on priorities based on now that we have a full understanding of street repair need on residential streets, street repair need on arterials, sidewalk repair need, and our public facilities, then we need to say, okay, what's the total cost? What's the percentages? Where are we go from here? How do we make this happen? Um, and, and how do we deliver for the community now? because uh, people need those things now. And as we've seen during the pandemic, the cost of materials is increasing at a rate so quickly that we would be better off borrowing money and repairing them today than experiencing continued increased costs over time. So I look forward to bringing an item back on that uh, in a couple weeks and uh, hearing more from the community on what their priorities are on how we would make sure that the percentages of funding allocated really meet the needs of what our community needs today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Member Supernock. Uh, thanks, thanks for the uh, presentation. And um, I just wanna make a comment on the PowerPoint presentation. 
uh, we didn't receive the, the PowerPoint till mid-afternoon. And I just, um, I want to refer to the um, streets and roadways map on page 12. So if anyone out there sees that, we have uh, a few inaccuracies. Um, just rest assured, we'll address those. In fact, the director and I have a briefing scheduled for tomorrow at 2 p.m. Sounds like we planned it, but uh, I was just lucky. Um, and so also on page 30 of the presentation, uh, references the pavement management system. So there are updates to this map that you're that you're seeing in the presentation, and we'll get all those straightened out tomorrow. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Sorrow. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you. I want to thank uh, Mr. Lopez for the presentation. It's really helpful for me as somebody who's you know, new to council to understand, and I, I do appreciate the visual images because it definitely illustrate you know, how bad it was before and how much it's changed. I always appreciate being able to share that with residents when changes are, you know, improvements are made in, in, in District 6. And I also want to just thank the Public Works team for all their work on all of this. You know, it's, um, you know, it, it takes, it's every day that, you know, we, we're, you know, the moment we leave our house, you know, we step on the sidewalk and, you know, so we, we um, you know, have a lot of Public Works things that are in front of us. And I do want to just add to this conversation about, yes, I think um, in addition to streets and sidewalk, playgrounds are important. I think it's important we really look at improving all of them because there are neighborhoods that are very dense where there are, they have no yard and the only source of area for young people to have physical activity and even to have play is at the playground. So I would just add to that, yes, playgrounds too in addition to the streets and sidewalks. Um, you know, I also want to mention that when I think about streets and si sidewalks, I think a lot about concrete. It's just, it's a lot of pavement and concrete. And I want us to think about too, how do we green these areas, right? Um, how do we ensure that while we want to create these smooth sidewalks for people to recreate in, that we're also conscious that it does create urban heat and it just gets hotter and hotter, right, as we're trying to address climate change. So I'd love for us to be able to consider that as we're um, going through these plannings in the ways we can green alleyways and other, um, other you know, walkways. Um, so I'll end on just a question around the unfunded needs. Um, so you have all these streets and road improvement. And so I see $1.77 billion and it has a 2021. Is that just uh, the last time it was calculated as far as the amount of money it would take? It's on page 29. So if you can help me understand these numbers, because it's a lot of money and, and I just don't know if it's the latest of these date indicate they're the latest estimates. So, uh Councilman, so the uh, the 1.77 billion number is uh, the cost uh, to that it, the amount that it would cost us if we were to uh, fix all of our streets uh, within a five year period. So it's oh, just years. it's just uh, meant to give us an overall uh, sense of the scale. Um, obviously, uh, we the 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 solution is going to be a multi year effort beyond just five years. Uh, but, you know, the study focuses on just, you know, just a snapshot, a five-year snapshot. Okay. As well as these others, like the alleyway paving, is it within kind of a period of, like, that's the estimate as well? Just wanting to understand. This. Yeah, um, and I, I'll have to go back and check the details. Some of these are five years. Some of them are within a 10-year. Um, so um, I, I can follow up with the team and, and give you kind of the, the time frame associated with these. But uh, usually it does hover between five and 10. Okay, thank you. That, no further question on the item. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Price. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Excellent presentation. There are some wonderful projects on there. Um, I was just commenting to the city manager, the playgrounds that we've put in all throughout the city, the pop of color, it just screams fresh, new. It makes people feel good about their city. And um, I think that's, that's really important. And it, to me, like I said, it doesn't matter where in the city we put them in because we're stronger and better together if we can enhance facilities throughout the city. So anytime we put a new playground in, I get really excited. Um, regardless of where in the city it is, because I think it makes, it's, it's, a, it's a sense of pride that people have um, about the areas where their kids play. It's just, it's just really important to people because every single one of us who have kids 
our only goal in life is to give them the best life we can give them, right? And so when we live in a city that has newer facilities, we feel like we're doing a good job as parents to at least provide those to them. So I think that helps, it goes a long way, like the mayor said. The, the project that I'm most excited about on this list is probably one of the cheapest projects we have, and it's the Wibbit um, that's gonna go in, in Councilwoman Allen's district. I'm so excited about that. I was telling the city manager, that has got to be the best return on our investment that we have as a city. It's an inflatable and anyone who says that the beach doesn't serve the entire city and the entire region has not been out to see the Wibbit. The long line of kids waiting to use it. I mean, it's to me that the engagement of the beaches has magnified since we put the first Wibbit in and now we're gonna put the second one in. So I think it's gonna be great. Um, the, the only um, concern that I have is I'm excited about the possibility of a federal infrastructure plan. As chair of the Port Transportation and Infrastructure, um, the Port Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, um, I hope to really dive deep into what that means for the city, but the streets have got to be a major priority for us. They are a core service. We talk so much about programs that are great to haves, but things like infrastructure are need to haves. Uh, roads are need to haves. If residents are driving on major arteries in the city and crossing over multiple potholes every day to get to work, they do not feel like their tax dollars are being spent in the right way, even if we have amazing programs that people throughout the city are benefiting from. There's something to be said for the hardscape, the, the infrastructure projects that appear permanent, that make people feel like their city is taking care of them, and it goes a long way. It's kind of like the visual of the fire truck at the block party on 4th of July. Residents go out, they see it, they touch it, they feel proud of their city. It's the same thing with infrastructure. If people are driving down the road that is paved and they're not driving over potholes, they have a feel good feeling about their city. They feel like they're being taken care of. It's, it's a minor thing, but when they're driving over that pothole, they're reminded of all the things they don't like about their city. It's not just about the pothole. It's about the response times and it's about the climate issues and it's about you know the services not being open and facilities not being open. They're reminded of all the things they don't like about their city when they drive over these potholes. And so I know it's, I'm probably preaching here and on a soapbox that, that you as our public works director, Mr. Lopez, don't wanna hear, but we, you know, infrastructure and public safety, in my opinion, are must haves for a city. Everything else is a great to have, wonderful to have. But if people are driving over potholes every day and they're paying as much taxes as they are to live in this city, we're not doing our job. And so I think about projects on major arteries. I know Councilwoman Mungo and I, we're probably just one example. Every council district probably has one. So I'm just using mine because I don't know what I don't know and I know about my district. Studebaker, we've been talking about Studebaker for six years. Thousands of residents drive every day to go to work and use Studebaker. And every day they're reminded of things they don't like about the city. So I really wanna try to focus on getting the biggest bang for our buck in terms of infrastructure and where we can make the most impact with the limited resources we have. I hope the federal infrastructure package comes through and I hope we can benefit from that in some of these major arteries. But if not, we've gotta figure out how to close those funding gaps because I know Councilwoman Mungo has been involved in other joint use committee meetings where they voted to fund Studebaker. We sued Caltrans, we have some money there. It just seems like we can never make up that, that difference. And so we'd love to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Uranga. Thank you, and uh, I'm really pleased with a lot of the uh, discussion that's taking place today because obviously it's highlighting a lot of the needs that we have and I wanna thank staff for uh, uh, being straightforward and transparent in, in bringing what the, where we really are and what we need. Uh, very pleased and very happy that uh, the, the mayor has brought a focus to playgrounds. As I celebrated the uh, ribbon cutting of a new playground at Cherry Park, I also had the uh, this unfortunate incident that happened at Admiral Kidd Park, 
where we had a playground just completely destroyed. Uh, devastating to that community. Done. I mean, it's over. It, it needs to be replaced. And uh, I would like to see if we can somehow put a, a fast track on that playground because obviously all my council members here, to, to all nine of us, are focusing in on and, and explaining that we need playgrounds for our communities where our kids can go play and it, and it makes for a great uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, wherever there's a, there's a park and a playground. And obviously the devastation that we suffered in Admiral Kidd Park in the West Long Beach area is, is just, uh, I, can't, I can't express the, the heartbreak and the, and, the, uh, and the devastation that I feel for, for the loss of that park. So I really want to uh, have a, an opportunity to fast track a, uh, a playground for that area as soon as we can. It needs to be replaced. The, the, the void that that playground made to the West Long Beach is just, uh, just uh, devastating. But that's not to say that you know, it's the only priority we have. Obviously, there's a lot more. Uh, but second, uh, to me, and, and, that, and that's very important, is about the alleys. Uh, we, I had a lot of uh, dirt alleys in my district. Uh, fortunately, we've gotten uh, to fix quite a few of them. Uh, there's still a number that, that need to be fixed. And obviously, it's important for those alleys to be fixed for one major reason, if, if there's no one re reason at all, it's access. Access to our facilities, to our trucks, to pick up trash, and to uh, uh, be able to uh, have access to uh, other parts of, of the streets as they go through the alleys, that, that's what they're for. And then finally, of course, I would just mention right now in, in terms of our, uh, our potholes and streets. You know, when any community that you drive into and you see a nice, nicely paved streets with freshly painted uh, signs and, and, uh, and roadways. Uh, it makes you feel good about that city. And if there's anything that talks about what kind of city we have, it's the condition of its streets and its sidewalks. And obviously that's, that's something that we work for the most. I mean, uh, every, every council member has its issues with streets and sidewalks that we all try to prioritize them, but we can't unless we work with you, with, with, uh, with our, our city management in, in trying to prioritize that. And I know you have the difficult job of, of saying, you know, you got nine, nine uh, bosses here, if you will, and each one of them has its own needs, his, own, his or her own needs, and wanting you to prioritize that particular project. So I know the difficulty that you're confronted with. However, it, it's, it's uh, about the city as a whole, and we want to make sure that our city is the cleanest, the, the most uh, mobile that you can use in the region. And, and that's our goal. Our goal is to make Long Beach the best that it can possibly be. And uh, the only way to do that is by prioritizing what we want to do. And that's to keep our, our streets paved, striped, and safe. And uh, with uh, good playgrounds. <laughs> So that, that's my, that's my uh, emphasis. I'm gonna be trying to get that, uh, that playground back up and going and uh, let's, let's try to work together and see if we could find something uh, yeah, as soon as we can. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I, I did wanna just get uh, kind of an update to the whole council and that, that was a devastating fire. I think a lot of you saw it. Uh, it, it was arson. Um, uh, still trying to figure out exactly what happened there, but it was a total loss. Um, we are moving immediately uh, to just clean the site, and we need to just find the resources to clean the site and uh, put it back to a, a sand area. And then uh, we're looking to do some temporary um, fixtures just to give people hope that that is going to be a site again, uh, you know, very quickly. And then we do need to prioritize finding money for that um, for that playground, so uh, so that we can get it restored to what it was before. Or, or it doesn't need to be exactly uh, restored to what it was before. We're looking at all kinds of different options. Thank you, Mr. Monica, for that update. Thank you, Councilwoman Allen. Yes, uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. And I also want to uh, thank Mr. Eric Lopez for this presentation. I had the privilege of attending last Tuesday's meeting at Mark Twain Library with Councilwoman Sorrow. And uh, I saw a bunch of my residents that were there and uh, very active um, in the uh, budget process. It was really great to see all the staff, um, see our city manager, Tom Modica, 
our uh, budget chair, um, Councilman Austin, um, all out in the community, um, just interacting with these residents and the roundtables and um, really listening to uh, their priorities. So that was just uh, great to see. I also agree with my, all of my colleagues about the importance of the roads and the alleys and uh, all of the playgrounds. So um, I don't know if you can see this big smile that I have right now underneath this mask, <laughs> but um, it's big. Um, I, I do, I agree with you, Councilman Price. I love this water playground. I don't know, it looks like it's the size of a football field. And I know that um, children and kids all, all over the city are uh, going to enjoy that. Um, and then when I look at you know, the basketball courts and, and just all of the things that's happening here, it's just, it's just really uh, exciting. Um, I do have uh, one question uh, for you. Um, with regards to the convention center, can I get some type of like analysis at some point in the future um, on what the outlook of the maintenance needs are for the uh, convention center and then how that is going to be funded? Because I don't see that here, but it doesn't mean it's not here. So um, I'm going to ask that. And then um, one other uh, question. Can you, Mr. Lopez, um, go into a little bit more detail about um, on page 44, the bikeway and pedestrian improvements? projects and, and what they are going to look like? So let me answer the first part and then I'll turn it to Eric. Um, yes, we can certainly dive more into the convention center. One of the things that we spent Measure A on is really getting data and analysis on all of our city facilities. Prior to Measure A, we kind of had to estimate or we had to go look at each one uh, when it was time to do it, but we didn't have a comprehensive analysis. And so we did that with our streets so we could make database decisions on our streets. We did it with sidewalks. We did it with alleys. And now uh, we are finishing up on our facilities. So we have gone through the convention center as one of our major facilities. Uh, it has in the $55 million range worth of need over the next several years uh, for upgrades. Uh, some of those are things like HVAC systems that haven't been touched since the 90s uh, and uh, need to be improved. So uh, we can get into the, more of that. That's kind of what our discussion on infrastructure is going to be, is looking at those longer term things, not things that are funded this year, but what are our challenges and what are some of the opportunities. And Eric, if you can talk about pedestrian mobility, please. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, so uh, for the bikeway and pedestrian improvements, uh, we have 1.45 million proposed for FY22. Um, the, this program is intended to help us repair and maintain um, uh, bike corridors um, and uh, for and to reduce uh, future uh, infrastructure expenses. So it is a uh, maintenance uh, type of program. We actually um, our funding for this consists of measure, measure of County Measure R for Metro, County Measure M also for Metro, and some air quality um, uh, funding uh, that that we get. Um, we have uh, a series of locations of focus, um, including our Orange Avenue Backbone Bikeway, our Pine Avenue Bike Boulevard, our P Pacific Avenue Cycle Track, our Downtown Walkable Streets the Atherton um, street uh, bikeway areas, the livability initiatives, and we also use some of these funds for grant matching funds. So it's a multitude of uses, um, I, and it does change year, year to year depending on some of our grants. Uh, so I'd be happy to give you more details on, on, on that uh, category if you'd like. All right. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Thank you, Councilman Mungo. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the comments of my colleagues and thought I would add to uh, a couple of comments. Uh, a big thank you to Councilman Price. We talk about Studebaker. Studebaker has been a mishmash of funds and trials and meetings in places I'd never been to before. Uh, we've looked at technology that got us a grant to try something new on one piece of Studebaker, but not on other pieces. And so I think that Public Works has been really creative um, and the residents are ready for it to be done. So uh, we're very excited to continue to move forward with that. Um, as for Councilman Saro, she brought up an excellent point. When you go to page 29, when you look at this, um, I noticed it during the presentation, but I'll bring it up. It doesn't have a total. And I know why it doesn't have a total, because that total is a scary, scary number. But I think it's important that we talk about it. This does not include parks and recreation needs unless it is a facility. And the need list is $3.54 billion. And I think it's important for people to recognize that that is a very, very big number. 
I think the other thing that's interesting is when you compare it, and I think this is a, a philosophical conversation that Councilman Price may want to lead at infrastructure, and it's, it's up to her, she's the chairwoman. When you flash back to page 27 and you look at mobility, which is 6.3 million of the 21 million, so less than 25, uh, let's see, I'd have to use a calculator, but less than 20, 20, mm, just over 20%, maybe 25%. But you look at page 29 of what the mobility need is, Streets and road improvements, 50%, alleys, 3%, sidewalk management, 17%. So 77% 70, 70 of our need is mobility, but only, I did that wrong, 6.3 6 divided by 21.63, only 30% of our allocation is going towards mobility. And on top of that, Park and Recreation is 1.2 million. That just seems like one playground. And I know that we've been working really hard to have one all accessible playground in the city. And I think it's current funding levels under 200,000. We're a million short to get to where we need to. And an all accessible playground is going to be more expensive than a typical big playground. And so um, I just think that from a philosophical standpoint, obviously our commitment um, to the five-year map was a priority and maybe I should be making the division out of the final column on the right hand side to see where all that money went over time and I know that there's a lot of different needs that really pushed measure a but if we want to fund things I think the other thing we need to look at too is uh, councilman price talks about pride in your city we started a signage program and that program's now been unfunded for two years it's great that the convention area or the Tidelands areas can get some signs of the airport, but the rest of our city has identity and entrance points. And Councilwoman, Councilman Richardson and I have a lot of entrance points to the city that the community was promised signage and pride and, and it just hasn't materialized. And I think we need to make sure that's available. And then my last note is the County of Los Angeles just put out a notice. The supplies necessary to make HVAC repairs are not even available. I mean, the wait lists for what we need, if we plan to do something in March of next year, we should be ordering parts now because there's so many back orders. So I think we really need to get a comprehensive HVAC overhaul look into our system. That and what I'm also hearing is overhead door repairs. The, the cogs and the wheels and the things that we need from certain countries are just not coming in because of backlogs and supply um, creation during COVID. And so if we can go into that and figure out what the truth is, postpone some projects that won't have the materials necessary. And then lastly, I wanna talk about private funding. We do not lean on our private funding partners enough. Um, we have Partners of Parks. The moment that that playground burned down, Partners of Parks should have had a nonprofit GoFundMe up. And the GoFundMe executive director from the, the organization, they usually put in 20 grand to get you started. There's a lot of opportunities out there that we're just not capitalizing on. When you bring in or really invest in your fire foundation or your parks foundation or your library foundation, the library foundation's done amazing things. But our parks program and partners of parks is sitting on a bench list of donors that wanna give five grand each for two, three, five years. And so if we don't give them the opportunities to put in the benches or name a field or name a playground after themselves. Hell, you wanna give me a million dollars? I will make it the Eric Lopez playground. I will make it whoever's playground so that we can give the children what they need and get to 3.54 billion because tax dollars alone are not gonna get us there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll just add my comments here before we go to public comment and wrap it up. So I, I agree with everything the council members have said. I think everyone has a good understanding of their districts and their needs. I think we all agree on streets and sidewalks. Um, you know, one thing I will say is that, you know, I'm not a big fan of the two year uh, plan. You know, I remember, you know, and, and I've got a lot of institutional knowledge, 11 years here. I remember when it was, you know, here's how much every district gets. You go to your community, you make a priority, you pave what it is and you get input on what's in design for next year. So people have some sense of what's going on. The two year plan, I'll tell you, I look at the streets and the CIP, I don't know any resident <laughs> who looks at that and says, yeah, that's it. Secondly, I think um, the sh it just used to go further. It seemed like 
uh, it, you know, the amount of street we would get, you know, I remember when it was a half a mile, then it went down to like a quarter of a mile. It just seems like it doesn't go as far as it used to be. Maybe it's costs have increased. I'm not sure. But uh, I, I'm not necessarily committed to the system that we have. I think what makes more sense is we've gone through in the last decade two different strategies. And I think we need to just, um, you know, be very, very clear about when we're starting a new process and when we're stopping. So people don't, so the reset button get, doesn't get set over and over on residents. Because I can tell you, I, I, we're just now getting to Artesia Boulevard. Steve Neal talked about Artesia Boulevard when he was sworn into office in 2010. And it is 2021, and we're not breaking ground until Q1 of 2022. That's 12 years waiting on one corridor. And South Street is the same story. Market Street is the same story. I mean, the, it's the same story in these corridors. So something's not not working, and we have to really figure out how we are can be serious with the residents about what we can actually deliver. And so, you know, I like you a lot, uh, Mr. Lopez. I would love to see your thoughts on uh, how we address that. Um, secondly, you know, you know, we're knocking out a, a list of things in in North Long Beach because everybody know has a different understanding of what need is. At one point, it was we need a library. We focused on that. We got that done. Uh, prior to then, it was the fire station. We were at a little one, then we needed a one that was a decent size. You know, the community center, raining every year. The shelter, it's an emergency every year. The health center, finally getting there. But, you know, a lot of those decisions are depend are determined by grown-ups, adults who are saying, this is the priority. And every time, we prioritize what the grown-ups need. But in all that time, it's hard to provide for the youth. I'm excited for all of the playgrounds across the city. They look great. I take my kids to these playgrounds. We're trying to get to every signature playground in the city. But again, my district, and this is where I just gotta speak up for my community, my district has more children than any district in the city and still has not built a new playground. And there is plenty of need there's plenty of opportunity. I don't want to take away from what any other council member said about their needs, but at some point we need to deliver a playground in my community. Uh, Houghton Park, Ramona Park, prime candidates surrounded by schools and children. So we certainly need to deliver that. Um, the second thing I would say is we certainly, I'm almost done guys, almost done. The second thing I would say is the most important thing we can do right now together is advocate to Congress because uh, all the hopes and dreams we, we just heard, as of right now, a local street program is not included in the Congress, Congressional Infrastructure Plan. I'm not sure if you guys know that. Today, it's not included in the program. And unless we get with our members of Congress and advocate, we need to advocate for those things in order to make it reality. Uh, in recent months, you know, through, through SCAG and through FetLedge, um, we've had a number of conversations pushing this. Alex Padilla, uh, Maxine Waters, Nanette Barragon, Lowenthal, Sanchez, Schiff, we're pushing that. Um, it's hard to advocate now because we can't go to D.C. It's almost, you know, our advice from the lobbyists is don't even come. It's not even worth it. The, the you know, the virtual lobbying is incredibly important. So we got to have to get creative in how we do that. Um, our FetLedge committee is going to continue doing that. We're going to advocate uh, through our, our advocacy strategy and Denton's and everybody to continue focus on that. But that's the most significant thing we can do. It looks like uh, Senate is going to take it up very soon, like in August. The Senate will take it up, and then we should have the House take it up and finish it in September. That's the hope. So we have a little bit of a window to get to members of Congress and talk about a local road program, because right now it's not a part of the part of the package. So those are my generally my thoughts on this. And at this point, we're going to open up, see if there's any public comment. There's no public comment. All right, no public comment. So uh, we're done with this. Members, please cast your vote. Motion carries. All right, we have one more round of public comment. I'm not sure who's who's here, um, but I'm gonna read all of them. Um, first is Jazai Danner, then Sanai Kinfei, then David McGill Soriano, um, Andrew Mar Mardu Mardu Mardujano, forgive me, um, Mario Solorzano, Travis Harlan Jr., Emiliano Hernandez, and Edric Salgado. So let's start with, is Jazai here? Okay, Jazai, you're up. Hello, everyone. My name is Jazai, actually. 
uh, Jazz A. Danner, and I am, <coughs> excuse me, I'm a resident of Grisham Community Housing that is located in District 8, and we have had some, some issues that have been going on. I want to precurse this by saying that uh, I have went through the chain of command, you know, trying to talk to my management, as well as, you know, the company. They, have, they really don't care about the, the lives of the residents at this point, uh, is what it seems like. And our issues are mainly uh, trash and safety. So uh, our trash doesn't, we have a, a building of over um, about 100 uh, units. Um, and our trash only comes maybe once a week and sometimes twice. There's been stints where trash only came uh, twice a month before. Uh, so also with that, you know, comes with um, the infiltration of, you know, wild animals and, and things like that, you know, in the neighborhood. Um, also, moving into safety, uh, we have uh, last year, um, in March of 2020, we had a shooting, resulted of gun violence. I know um, Councilman Austin knows about that one, um, and uh, a resident uh, son got shot. He did not, you know, die, fortunately. Um, but my uncle, who's also uh, in his 70s, uh, almost got shot in that crossfire as well. Um, and nothing has really been done about the residents who are a product of the gang violence that live there, um, you know, getting them moved out or anything like that. Um, nothing has resulted of that. So there's been a lot of uh, management negligence. Um, there's the upkeep of the apartments are like slim to none. Um, there's residents that live uh, upstairs who uh, basically um, don't bathe regularly because they're scared of falling through their apartment. Um, uh, it's very dark in the apartments as well. Um, there's no lights like outside so when it, you know it gets at about eight o'clock there's no lights in the parking lot kids are always outside um and uh kids don't play in designated play areas as well um and so obviously you know kids are, are playing around cars and uh, my car has actually been vandalized as a result of that um there's also like elderly people that live in the apartments who don't have access to uh, garage gates to get out and they have to go to dialysis and things like that. Um, so there's been a lot of negligence and we have tried to contact uh, everyone that we know to contact. So this has been our last resort and I've been the one that has been, you know, brave enough to come here and let the city know that the residents need some help. And uh, yeah, we have a, a security guard who does really nothing. Uh, he is uh, actually like he fraternized with the with the gang, the gang members and things like that. Um, also concerned with safety, there is uh, no locks on the gates of our apartment building. So you know when you know gang members can you know run from the police if, if there's a problem. So we have your time, but we hear you. Councilman Austin wants to address. You. Okay. Yes, uh, if you can see my, my chief of staff here, or if you can hang around, I'll be happy to talk to you when we adjourn. Okay, directly. sounds good. All right, and in my office, we're aware of a lot of the challenges. Yeah. We've heard from them, um, and we've tried to put some resources, but I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. Sounds good. All right, thank, thank you. Uh, I don't see Sanai, so the next speaker is David McGill Sorian, Soriano or Sorian, I'm not sure. And then after David is Andrew Mardujano, and then uh, Mario Solazano. David, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I know we were just about like five minutes late. Um, I wish it was held back a little bit, but um, I'm David from Books and Buckets, uh, right in the Washington neighborhood. and. Uh, I was born and raised in the Washington neighborhood and I grew up there. Um, and the Books and Buckets is a youth program focused on academic and athletic development of local youth in the Washington neighborhood to empower them, their lives, their families, and their community. And so we can have neighborhood impact led by local youth in the neighborhood through a place-based approach. And when I was growing up, just like the youth in the Books and Buckets program, um, you know, there was a lot of stressors around the neighborhood in the Washington neighborhood in that area and a lot of influences and I could, there were so many paths I could have went down and 
at one point I was heading down that path of going, um, getting involved with uh, influences with gang affiliations and um, low level delinquency and stuff like that and looking up to things like that. But luckily I had uh, mentors um, in my life along the way and I heard about a program um, across town. It was actually not in, in Long Beach, it was in Lakewood. And I had to hop on the 172 from Pacific and 16th and get off of Palo Verde and Delamo, which is about a one hour bus ride. And then I have to walk to Del Valle Park, which is airplane park over there, to be a part of this youth program that they had. And luckily, the, it, was a, it was a paid program and it was expensive, hundreds of dollars. But luckily, um, I was able to join the program and uh, not be charged uh, and just be able to pay when I can pay. And it was a great coach and great mentor. Um, and that program changed my life and I turned into a straight A student and I started to focus on college and the next steps in high school and then uh, playing uh, at the next level and I really focused in on my craft. And when I got older, I looked around in my neighborhood and I was like, why did I have to take that bus ride? Why can't I just have something in my neighborhood? And then that's the idea of Books and Buckets came around that, you know, local youth should have a neighborhood program, something that's for them that they can walk to. Now Books and Buckets just finished, uh, we're just finishing up our summer 2021 uh, academy and we have 25 plus local youth in the Washington neighborhood. These youth walk to the neighborhood program and then they walk home. Um, these are youth I see around town and we have local community residents uplifting the program. And I think that's the difference of it. Well, there's a lot of youth programs and there's a lot of youth organizations doing some great work, but the difference of Books and Buckets is we're doing a place-based approach focused on our hands around the Washington neighborhood. Local youth know the neighborhood program. They're able to access it a lot easier and we're able to focus more on the local youth and have a quality program because we know exactly what's going on day in, day out because the people who are uplifting the program are in the neighborhood as well. Um, and, and it's a great program. Thanks for, uh, we appreciate Councilwoman Mary's in the house office and everything you've been doing and advocating and for funding the program. And we're gonna be able to able come back. Uh, appreciate that so much. And I know you guys showed the video earlier, but we have a couple of Books and Buckets youth as well who will say a few words, but thank you. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Next, we have Mario. After Mario is, no, actually, Andrew is next. It's Andrew, then Mario, and then Travis, you're up next. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Mandujano. Don't worry, Vice Mayor. Uh, you did far better than many of my <laughs> high school teachers. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm here just to speak in support of the Books and Buckets uh, Youth Academy. Um, shout out to David, Travis, Andy, uh, Gabe, so many uh, dedicated individuals who met for over the course, I think over like a year or For almost two years um, really planning the curriculum um, of this academy which has proven to be a transformational academy for uh, these youth and also the Washington neighborhood and also a huge shout out to you uh, Councilwoman uh, Mary Zendejas for also acknowledging it and realizing the huge and tremendous impact it's having uh, on their lives and again like in the Washington neighborhood but I think the the one of the most beautiful things about it is that it, it, it takes you know mentorship, it takes coaching, it takes training, it combines all of it, and also touches on uh, things like gang intervention, violence prevention, and so many different uh, components that uh, a lot of these youth uh, face, that I face, that David has faced, Travis has faced. Um, and one of the uh, another beautiful thing about it is it's not just also affecting the Washington neighborhood, but it's also affecting other council districts too. Uh, my nephew actually lives in District Seven. He attends the academy as well, and I can just see the the transformation in his character, his drive, his passion, and, and his commitment in, in changing his life and also the the uh, the lives of his fellow community members. And so, on behalf of my nephew who couldn't be here today, um, I would actually like to ask. Um, Councilman uh, Roberto Uranga, uh, again, on behalf of my nephew, uh, if you could also match uh, the amount that uh, Councilwoman Mary Zendejas has, has provided to the Books and Buckets Academy. So uh, thank you all, and again, thank you, uh, Councilwoman Mary Zendejas. All right, thank you. Next, we have uh, Mario. No, that was Mario. We have Travis. That was Andrew. We have Mario. Where's Mario? You're Mario. Come on up, Mario. Travis, you're next, and then Emiliano. Hello. I'm Mario Solorzano. I'm from the Books and Buckets program. Uh, what's it called? I grew up around the Washington neighborhood, and obviously it's kind of tough out there, especially since all the gang violence. And thank you for the program, for helping us out, especially 
since like <laughs> what's it called especially since our, we're all young trying to get out of a place that has a lot of violence just want to say thank you for them to helping us grow do much better <laughs> what's it called um what's it called to want to say thank you to them and especially to Mary for helping us help out for our program next year. And thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next we have Char Travis and then Emiliano. If you guys just, whoever's next just comes forward, it's a lot more efficient. So Travis, then Emiliano, then Edric. <clears throat> Hello guys, uh, my name is Travis Harlan. Uh, I'm a Long Beach resident. I currently reside on the west side. Um, <clears throat> dang, it's weird. Um, David came to me probably about almost two years ago with the idea of books and buckets. He didn't even have to explain it to me and I was just like, yes. Um, this is at the time I was coaching at Cabrillo High School and I was also, what else was I doing at that point in time? probably working like two, three jobs or whatever, whatever may ca case may be. But I think the, the impact of books and buckets is so important because as me, as a, uh, a professional hooper, I think stuff like that, getting kids started early and keeping them out the streets with stuff like this is super important. Mind you, I come from a family that I couldn't play on no, like, I couldn't play on no big AAU team or get into any basketball programs because obviously we couldn't afford it at that point in time. By the time I started getting into basketball, the Great Recession happened, and that's when I didn't have bus money. So I would walk from Wardlow to almost PCH just to get to school. And then I would have to be at Silverado Park, which is not the greatest park to be at sometimes. Or I was at Kings Park, which is also not a great park to be at at some certain uh, points in time. But having having this program, having something like this is just inspiration for the kids to do better. They just want to, uh, some kids just want to come hoop and some kids like the book that we're reading. It's, um, it's just things like this, when people see it, they ask me about it all the time. And I just love talking about it. I love just giving them the greatest gist. I have people coming out and reach out to help with the program and things like that. And it's just, it's just awesome to see. You see the growth of these kids every week and it's just it's just awesome it's just really dope i think it's just one of the best things that can possibly happen to these kids at this point in time especially with COVID. you know and, uh, and that's it all right thank you travis next emiliano and then edric is edric here okay come on forward Ed edric uh hello my name is emiliano hernandez 11 years old go to Washington. Uh, I go to Books and Buckets every day, try to get better. And yeah, um, what's it called? Yep, go ahead, finish what you, what you have to say. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tough living in the place I live, a lot of gang violence. Um, yeah. So you like the program? Yeah. And you're thinking Mary's in Day House? Yeah. Going there to get better so I can accomplish my dreams. And that's it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your courage, young man. All right, our last speaker is Edric. Hello, my name is um, Edric Salgado. I play at on 14th and Locust. I've been playing there since I was like 10, before it was just a regular basketball court. And I think the academy is fun. It like brings more people to go, more positivity. And I think it's just good for the environment because the environment there sucks. It's just full of homeless people and it's just a lot of negativity going on there. And I think the academy just helps out everybody, all the little kids to do something in life, be more positive what they have to do. And I think it's just good because when I was little, I never had nothing like that. So now that there's something, I feel like it's just good for the whole 14th and Locust. And yeah, thank you, Mary. Thank you, everybody. All right. 
Thank you. Uh, let's hear it for these young men one more time for speaking up. You know, and you know, I, I see uh, some council members are queued up, but I would just say when I was in middle school or high school, I had never spoken at a city council meeting. And uh, to speak up and say a program is doing a good thing, that's the type of uh, comment that actually resonates very well with us. Uh, so thank you so much for speaking up tonight. Uh, Councilwoman Mungo? Okay, all right, so we're good. Thank you so much, that adjourns the meeting. Is anybody queued up for any final comments? All right, I got a couple announcements. Um, so one, we have uh, the 9th District Community of Interest Outreach Meeting on Wednesday, August 11th at 6.30 to discuss the topic of redistricting. This meeting will be held in person at the Doris Topsy Elbert Community Center at Houghton Park, as well as virtually online. Uh, uh, your community, your voice, I encourage you to show up and, and speak on this important topic. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to invite you to uh, share your feedback on the Great Artesia Boulevard uh, project um, at Activate Artesia Boulevard. It's an open street event, Saturday, August 21st, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., Artesia Boulevard from Atlantic to Orange. Uh, Reimagine Artesia Boulevard, test out proposed street improvements to make it safer, more enjoyable to walk and bike and roll along Artesia. Enjoy pop-ups from local businesses, food trucks, great music, a basketball zone, a kid zone, uh, and so much more. And so be sure you join us for that. Uh, secondly, the Uptown Jazz Festival is, is back uh, August 20th and 21st. On the 21st, our headliner is Sheila E. Look forward to seeing you there. Um, National Night Out is tonight. I think we missed it. Uh, we have 11 going on in our District 9 neighborhood. Hope you're out being safe and enjoying it. And finally, please join the celebration uh, well, we missed that too. That was a 6.30, the Jordan High School uh, banners to unveil the class of 2021 banners. Thanks everyone. Uh, next we have Councilwoman Sorrow. Um, yes, so I am having my District 6 field open house where we're gonna be featuring unveiling our art murals designed and painted by uh, local uh, District 6 artists as well as Long Beach artists. And we're gonna have a resource fair and Long Beach uh, the city of Long Beach will have a job recruitment um, tent there and we're going to have our neighborhood groups and hot dogs by our firefighters and we want people to stay for a movie night of Dr. Doolittle um, that evening. So it's going to be on uh, Monday, next Monday, August 9th, 6 to 8 p.m. at the Ernest McBride Park and Calrec Community Center. Thank you. All right. Are you cute? Councilman Austin. And I wanted to uh, invite the public out, particularly those in uh, the North Long Beach area, to the community budget meeting, which will be at the Michelle Obama Library on uh, August the 12th. Um, that is uh, at 6 p.m. So please come out and join us uh, for that. Uh, it will be a budget uh, presentation as well as a opportunity to, for you to be a part of the visioning for uh, the next uh, 10 years in our city. That's a great process. Uh, also, uh, Friday, uh, August 6th, I want to invite everyone out to uh, Bixby Knowles for First Fridays. It will be back. Um, we'll be um, and asking folks to be safe, wear your, your mask, and, and, and you know, be smart and distance, but come out and enjoy art and music and, and uh, some of the great uh, uh, festivities that we have in place uh, for uh, First Fridays. Uh, and then lastly, I'd just like to thank uh, all of my colleagues and, and uh, folks in the city family here, but also constituents and community for their, their uh, kindness and many words of uh, support uh, during over the last couple of weeks as uh, my family's dealt with uh, the, uh, the passing of my father. And so again, I want to thank uh, my colleagues. Are really, those words of kindness and, and those cards and flowers really went a long way to, to help uh, help us get through it. So thank you so much. Thank you. And the city council meeting is adjourned. Have a great evening.